Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. I'm Vince D'Addario. That's Brian Driscoll, and it's a Friday free for all mailbag. The best day of the week, baby. Vince's favorite day. It is. It's it's my favorite day of the week, and it was. It will continue to be my favorite day of the week. But y'all can help me with that by hitting that like button, hit that subscribe button, all of the different things that you can do. Tell your friends about us. Notification bell because we're going to have a show tomorrow. So you're going to want to. You're going to want to. Ooh, okay, we'll okay. Talk about that as we kind of get started. We're gonna have a special show tomorrow, and it's not gonna be a Garth Brooks pregame show. Like that's not what no. we're gonna be doing tomorrow no. at all. No. Um, but uh, I actually met one of our uh, our avid listeners the other day. Came into school, and it, we were talking. He's like, just to see you. Boy. He goes, I know that voice because <laughs> he yeah. just doesn't do it on the podcast. So he didn't like, come in just to see you, right? He didn't just show up yeah. at your high school. Like I'm looking Yo, for jerk. Vince D'Addario. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Yeah, that would be real creepy. Yeah. Um, but uh, it would. I would still give you know say hey, what's be up. Kind of cool. Kind of. Yeah. Humbling. No, it would Don't be. Don't cool, do it. No one do it. But it's amazing the people I see out and about that are like, yeah. hey. I, but so it, yeah. it's awesome. But anyway, we have a so, great. I, like I've told, I was joking so about great. this the last four or five times I've been out in public. I've had someone come up and like you know, you know, hey, are you? One guy didn't know who I was because I had just shaved my beard, and so he's <laughs> like, I be. I was like, are you familiar with Irish Brands? Yeah, it's I'm Brian and. And I love it because it it's just great. shows what kind of great community we're building. And I'm, no I'm happy to know that there's local people that listen to our show, too, which I think is great. So I, I love the community we're building, and it's a lot of fun, and we appreciate you all being here. No and doubt. I've had meetings this week with – or last two weeks with people from SI. They're loving what we're doing. I've met with Blue Wire. Beautiful. They're loving what we're doing. I'm not meeting with anybody from Google. They don't care. <laughs> so we have been, you know, we're good. <laughs> With the people we work with on a daily basis are happy with the community, but it's because of the, what y'all are building. And so yeah. uh, we just to give you an example of, of how great it's been last month in April, we had over two million page views on our message board and our website. Last year on our site alone, we had about 400,000. So it's been so much fun growing this and we have a great community, tons of great conversation on the message board. But yeah. right now, the focus is on our daily mailbag and that's we have right tons you guys of drive it already you guys so are driving the show and rolling so let's let's go down the road let's here get it rocking and rolling we're gonna do recruiting and team both hours you Why know not? so we're just gonna get rocking and rolling and if something needs to be held over for when ryan's on here we'll hold it over or we may ask it again if it's something that Why we not? might get his opinion on as well so, so vince so let's get started at the top man absolutely so the first question is not from john a1 which is different so we'll, i love it it's so scott has a quick question here. He says, good day, IB. Do we have any recruits that have commitment dates set? Yes. So this was not, I don't, I didn't know that this was supposed to be public, but uh, <laughs> 247 Sports does their commitment countdown thing. The, the kids that are going to do it on their show, they put it out there once kids agree whether the kids have gone public with it or not. There are two Notre Dame prospects who are going to be making a decision here soon. Tomorrow, four o'clock is the schedule time is right now. Devin Houston is going to be making his commitment on CBS sports. We will be live for that at four o'clock. So we'll carry that live and we'll talk about whatever his decision may be. And then what it means for Notre Dame after he makes that decision. So that'll be at four o'clock, Notre Dame, Michigan, other schools are the ones contention as we've been telling you for a, a few weeks now, love where Notre Dame is on that one. And they did a great job in that recruitment. Now Washington and Marcus Freeman both have done a phenomenal job in that recruitment. Chad Bowden as well has been very instrumental in that recruitment. So they've done a great job there. Now it's about closing time, right? And we'll have more on that one tomorrow. Also on May 13th, Sullivan Absher is going to be making his decision. The offensive lineman from North Carolina, talented player. As we talked about before, Clemson was – crushing that recruitment for a while. He had been on campus. He'd met Coach Heastan, like Notre right. Dame a lot. They made his top three, but Clemson was the team to beat, and Notre Dame did a tremendous job during his visit during the Blue Gold game weekend. We feel really good about where things stand with Notre Dame right now. Now, again, there is seven days left, and what I've always said is when commitments like this happen, 
and a kid knows is making his decision and, and schools know where they're trending, you got that last week to throw all throw everything you got at a kid, yeah, right? Absolutely. And so Notre Dame's going to have to do the same thing. Clemson's going to do the same thing. NC State's going to do the same thing. We've talked a lot about this on the message board. I believe we've talked about this on the show as well. Ryan and I both have uh, feel really good about where Notre Dame stands. We feel that coming out of that visit, Notre Dame put themselves in position to be the team to beat for Sullivan Absher. So Crazy. those are two big ones. I mean, those are two top 250 up. kids. Yeah, Devin Houston to me is 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 underrated at in, as a top 250-ish kid. To me, he's more of a top 150 kid. 6'5", 270, athletic really good i mean he, he, really good projection for the nose and the nerd defense but he's not a nose right i think he fits that nose position great but you know he's the kind of athlete he can play three technique he can go out and play a five technique vince and an odd front like he could play all he could play all of the power positions in the nerd right. defense right but i love him for the nose position but he's not pigeonholed at nose right he's more like howard cross than he is kurt heinish you know what i mean in, in that he can move all over he's bigger and longer than Howard Cross, but I mean, as far as positional flexibility, he's more Howard Cross than he is Kurt Heinish, who was more of a pure nose, or Jason right. Adamiola, who's more of a three edge. I think Devin can bring a little all of that to the table. Really unique player, and you know, again, he's a, he's a Maryland kid. He's he's no, this is an era Notre Dame has to have more success, and and so hopefully this can be the first domino to fall, and we'll you know we'll have a lot more to say about his recruitment and what we know and backstory and all that kind of stuff tomorrow. Once he announces his decision to Sullivan Absher is a guy that Notre Dame has been on for a while. Harry Heastan loves him. You know, he's a, he's a kid that's going to need a little bit of work, Vince, because he's coming okay. from a triple option offense, you know, but he's a big kid. He's got to you know, get his body reshaped a little bit, but man, he's powerful. He's quick off the ball. He plays tackle. Now I think when you put him in, a, you know, I, I think he's more of a tackle guard for me, right? Mm -hmm. Tackle guard for me. I like him more at guard. I know other people like him at tackle. Notre Dame is recruiting him to play tackle with knowing that he could obviously move to guard. That's what Coach Eastan does. Yep. yep. And, and so I really, really like this kid. Really like this kid a lot. You know, he, he's kind of grown. He's one of those guys that's kind of grown on me a little bit. You know, he's the top 250 kid. You know, good player, strong kid. He's another guy that Notre Dame has identified. I mean, this is a guy that Harry Eastan early on said, yep, I right. like that guy. Let's go get him. And and, and you, you see why, Vince. He's He's a tough kid. You know, I mean, he's got a lot of technique work that that's going to be needed because he comes from a different type of offense. Right. But he's physical. He gets after it. And, you know, with some work from Harry Heastan and Matt Bayless, I think he's got a chance to be a really good player. So those are the two Notre Dame players right now, Notre Dame recruits right now that have commitment set. And obviously the Notre Dame staff is going to try to close on those and continue to, you know, put themselves some distance between themselves and, and everybody that's trying to chase them for that top spot. And we had a question from Keith Wiegand about uh, you know where he's going to be announcing from. I don't know the answer to that, Devin Houston. I don't know. he uh, Keith is from Hagerstown. I, I don't know the answer to that, Keith. I have not. Devin has not tweeted anything about this. And it, CBS Sports is the one that it put it on. They didn't even announce it. They just put it on their stinking commitment tracker thing hmm. that it's going to be tomorrow at 4 o'clock. So, uh, but uh, that's what CBS Sports said. That's when they're supposed to carry it. As we saw with Braylon James, they change these things all the time. So that's why you need to. Make sure you stay. You have the notification bell on so you can be informed when something like that happens and also why you need to either follow us on Twitter, be on the message board, all that stuff. Because the one thing you need to understand is not every bit of detail goes on every platform. And that's why you need to be locked into as many of them as you can. So that is the latest with Devin Houston and Sullivan Hampshire. All right, Brian. Well, uh, TB12 for Heisman is jumping in with both feet here, wanting to know about a, a slew of recruits and Brian's confidence level uh, in them. He says, what is your confidence level in these recruits to end up at Notre Dame? Of course, Dante Moore, uh, Jagasaw, Mpemba, Osbury, Downs, and Lamar. So he's, he's going for the heavy hitters here. All right. What is my confidence level? So let's give a, I mean, let's, what's kind of a, yeah, I was going to say, what, what, what know, kind of scale are we working with here? One to 10. Okay, And it's based on where things stand as of right now. Things obviously can change. If you would have asked me my confidence level in, Devon, in Sullivan Absher a week before he visited for the Blue Gold game, I would have probably said five, right. you no know, five or six. Like, look, you had a puncher's chance because he was coming in for the visit. And anytime Harry right. Eastan gets a second face-to-face -face with a kid, and it's, and it's on, stuff. you know, it's, yeah. it's 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 it was a beautiful day, unlike in January 29th when he visited. It, you got a puncher's chance, right? Or the rest of the and, spring here. <laughs> right. So this is kind of basically where things stand as of right now. 
Okay, so we'll go we'll go one we'll go one to ten. And look with Dante Moore, I, I know this is one that most people want to hear about. My opinion has to change on this. I'd probably say eight. You know, I my I haven't heard anything in the last two months that's made me change my confidence level where Notre Dame stands. I know other schools are in the mix and all this other kind of stuff, and he's playing the social media game a lot more now and all that. And I'm just look, I'm I'm sitting back and just letting it play out. And if I hear, if I get Intel that says something different, I'll, I'll change my stance, right? I'm not being stubborn with it. I just haven't heard anything from anybody credible. That tells me that right. Notre Dame is not still, in my opinion, the team to beat. but until he makes his decision known, makes his decision and make it known it's anybody's ball game. But right sure. now I feel, I feel good about where things stand with him with Charles Jagasaw. I think Michigan has, has made a good charge in this one. I still feel really comfortable with where Notre Dame is. I'd probably say I'd probably say seven on him, but it's down. It would have been a nine a month ago, so it's down a little bit from from where it was before. But I still, obviously, as a seven, I feel I feel good. for me a seven is you know I, they're they're still I think the clear leader. They just got to close on him right, and that's the key. And he wants to kind of go through the process and do all these type of things. And I mean that's his right to do. But if Notre if Notre Dame is able to get Sullivan Absher here soon, and I feel really good about, I'm surprised he didn't have Monroe Freeling in there because that's one of the best prospects on the board. But I feel good about where Monroe Freeling is, Sullivan Absher. That's where I think Notre Dame can start to kind of push it a little bit and say, "Hey, man, you know, we want you to be part of this class, but you know, we we we, we can't miss. We can't afford to miss. We need to know where things stand with you." I think as of right now, I like where Notre Dame stands with Charles Jagasaw, with Samuel and Pemba. You know, look, he likes Notre Dame a lot. He always has. And and there was a time supposedly in the fall where he was ready to make a decision and everybody kind of felt Notre Dame was going to be the pick. I still think he loves Notre Dame. I think he likes a lot of things about Notre Dame. I just don't feel like right now he's going to pick Notre Dame. So I'm at like a five for him right now. And, and I know some people might say I'm crazy for that, but because because Samuel says all the right things, and I think he means those things. I think he believes yeah. those things. But I just think it's one thing to love Notre Dame and all that kind of stuff, but it's it's a different thing to say, okay, that's where I'm going. Yeah. And for me, I just don't – I have just for a while now just had this feeling like when push comes to shove, it's going to be a situation where I think other factors are going to have more of a say in that recruitment. And and I I think I I just right now I predict that he's going to stay down south, either go to Missouri or go to a Georgia, or Florida, something like that. Notre Dame is still battling with him. Obviously, they still love him, they still want him. But my and I think there's probably people in Notre Dame that have a little bit more confidence than I do. I you know, but I I don't just go with what the Notre Dame people tell me or what other sources tell me or what the kids say. I try to put it all together. And, and also kind of how I've been doing this for a long time. You just sometimes you get a feel, you know what I mean, yeah. Vince? And just for me, yeah. for whatever reason, I think I think Samuel and Pemble likes Notre Dame a lot. I just I've never felt confident he's going to actually pull the trigger for Notre Dame. And, and it, this isn't a negative thing. It's not like, oh, he's going to get bought. Or, I'm not saying any of that stuff. It's, it's, it's not a negative. I just think at the end of the day, I just think Samuel's going to look at certain factors and, you know, NFL and being close to the South and buying the, the SEC hype and all that. I just feel like, at the end of the day, I think those arguments are going to are going to carry a lot more for a kid who's right in the middle of SEC country. Right. And I just I also wonder how much the Rover linebacker pitch is really working, because I think other schools are kind of pushing, dude, you're an edge player. You know, you're you're a get after the quarterback kind of guy. And I don't know if Notre Dame can really sell that right now because they're kind of kind of full there right now. So I, I wonder if that, this is again, this is just my opinion. I wonder if that's factoring into his uh, sort of why I'm a little uneasy on just saying, yeah, they're going to get him. But again, they're still fighting and he loves Notre Dame. I mean, it, look, this is not an, he's never said a negative thing about Notre Dame. He's never said anything but great things about Notre Dame. It's not that kind of situation at all. I just think in the end, he stays down south. I actually feel a little bit more confident that Notre Dame's chances with Jaden Osbury than I do Sammy Nampemba. Mm. I probably put that one around a six right now. Now, look, there's a lot of game left with him. And he's going to – I mean, he's literally right there in LSU. It's, I think his high school's like somehow connected or like right by LSU's campus. They're not going to give up on him. But this – when I when I, when I I look at this kid, I just – for a long – I mean, a long time, even when I just didn't feel like they're going to get him, they had no shot because he's freaking from Baton Rouge. Pardon my language. is a little uh, uh, 
unprofessional there, but like he's from Baton Rouge, right? Like, I mean, he's from LSU's backyard. It's like there's no way they're gonna get that kid. Is he the one that yeah, he goes to university right. lab? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so when I look at it, I say, you know, boy, that's a that's an LSU kid through and through. But then you get to know him and you hear you talk to people that know him, he's a phenomenal student. Academics are super important to him and his family. His brother, his older brother, Austin committed to Auburn. I think they're going to be a player, but he liked Notre Dame a lot too. Just Notre Dame never pulled the trigger on him because he's more of a strong safety rover, you know, and they kind of already had that in the class. And so when I when I look at when I look at at, at the situation, Vince, I, I see a kid that to me is such a great Notre Dame fit in so many different ways. And it's like my initial, no, nah, I don't think they have a shot, was more of my own BKPTSD. Like, you're not going to go to into Baton Rouge and get a kid that LSU wants whose dad works at, like, I believe his dad, somebody told me his dad, like, works at LSU in some capacity. Like, you're not getting that kid. But the family has brought him up, I think, at least so far two times, I think maybe three times already on unofficial visits, meaning on their own dime, they've come up from Baton Rouge to see Notre Dame. I'm told the family is is really into more than just football, right? Like, hey, you need to think about this holistically, and that's yeah. one of the big reasons that that he's got this – that I view him as a Notre Dame kid. It's just he's got that strong support system that kids from areas like that need to have. And what I mean by areas like that is there are certain kids that live in areas that are very – geared towards that local school right when it's areas like that it's not referring to you know high school background neighborhood it's it's you're in lsu territory you're right. in texas territory right. you're in oklahoma territory. i'd be saying the same thing if he was from norman oklahoma or athens georgia or gainesville florida i mean that's where he's from he's from lsu's backyard in order to really have a shot with a kid like that you have to have a family that that views this as more than just football and from everything I've heard, the Osberries are very much that his that, that family is very much, hey, football is going to be gone somewhat soon. You got to make sure you're making a choice that's also going to help prepare you to be successful in life. And kids like that are always going to to have that attraction to Notre Dame. They have, I mean, and there's kids that have that attraction that their parents don't. And that's when those kids ultimately don't end up at Notre Dame. This is a situation where I think the young man and the family both yeah. get that. Now that doesn't guarantee he's going to pick Notre Dame. Because as we've seen, like Myron Roll, Myron Roll's a road scholar, he's a but surgeon, he still surgeon. felt Florida State was the best option for him in both areas, and that's that can be right. true for some people. So Notre Dame has a lot of selling to go there, and but I I feel better, I feel good about that. Well, not good, great, but I feel good about that when I put that one as a six. Caleb Downs, I'm still a three, and the reason is is I think he likes Notre Dame a lot. There's no doubt in my mind he gets along well with the Notre Dame commits. He's been on campus now three times. Five-star kid's been on campus three times. You're in the ball game, But I just feel like, for the kind of like in Pemba, even, but even less confident, at the end of the day, it's going to be a school with a more proven, proven track record of producing elite players in that position. Now, I know Harrison Smith and you know Kyle Hamilton, but I mean, I just, I see, I have a hard time seeing a kid from Georgia who plays defense not going to Georgia. Or school like that. I just I, I have a hard time with that one, right? But I will also admit that Caleb talks to almost no one. And I don't think anybody has a really good feel for that one. So you almost have to track his words. I mean, I mean his actions, not his words, because he doesn't have a lot of words. And his actions are the kid's been in Notre Dame three times. And he's coming sure. back in June for an official visit. So they're in the ball game there. And the staff has done a great job there. And this is probably me being overly pessimistic and my, you know, BK PTSD myself. But it's also about following trends, you know, and I just I, I just I feel like he's going to stay south. I, I do. Now, he's got an official visit to Notre Dame, an official visit to Ohio State, and his dad coaches football, I think, somewhere in Tennessee. So, I mean, the family's got, they're, you know, they they're not locked into Georgia like like other kids that, you know, who may be from Georgia. But I just feel like at the end of the day, this is going to be a hard one to, to do. Now, if I feel if we get if I get the same vibes coming out of the of the June visit that I had coming out of his most recent visit to Notre Dame, which was really good vibes. If I get those same vibes coming out of his next visit, then I'll bump this up. But I, it's just one of those ones where look, I'm always going to be honest with you guys. I could, I could pump sun, sunshine up your, you know what right now. And it sounds great. And then when he picks somewhere else, oh, well, you know, it was true at the time, but you know, things changed that easy cop out. 
I'm going to be straight with y'all. So I, that's just one that I have a, I have a, a, a tough time really saying, seeing them closing the deal, but man, they have done a fun Chris O'Leary, Marcus Freeman, uh, Chad or Chad Bowden. I mean, all the coaches have done of Mike Mickens. They've all been involved in this one. They've done a great job with Caleb. I don't think there's anything they could do different other than just move the campus about 350, 400 miles to the Southeast. <laughs> right. That's, that's about it, you know? And I just feel like, but man, they've done a great job on that one. I'm just not super optimistic about it. Jaden Lamar, I'd probably go nine right now. I, I think, you know, look, there's there's no such thing as a 10 unless a kid is committed. And even then, if he's taking visits, he's not a 10, right? And but I feel I feel really good about where this one's been going. And it's been going, it's been going good for a while. Once Dylan McCullough kind of zeroed in on that being the guy that I want to go with Cedric Irvin, I think they I think they put themselves in in great great position. He he's, he was at Arizona this last week, and I believe he has one more visit set up. But I I would I wouldn't be shocked if by the end of the month this one's over, and unless somebody you know look, there's other schools fighting for him, right? Like I said, he just went to Arizona. Arizona people are sleeping on Arizona, just in general. Arizona had a really strong recruiting class last year. They had three or four like top two fifty caliber guys last year. They got a borderline five star receiver in McMillan, the kid from Servite. So. They Jed Fish has got an NFL background. He hired some really strong recruiters on that staff. So I don't just dismiss Arizona like some other people are, but I think they'd have to do a lot to overcome where their name is. There's some other programs trying to do the same thing, UCLA, other places. So they're going to have to fight off some people here between now and the end of the month. But as of things stand right now, I, I feel super confident in, in Jay Lamar. So if I were to rank them comp, most confident, the least confident, Jay Lamar, number one, Dante Moore, number two, Charles Jagasol, number three, Jaden Osbury, four, Samuel Pemba, five, and then Caleb Downs, six. So that was a long answer, but I think hey. I gave you a ton of good, juicy nuggets hey. there from a recruiting standpoint, and I think it was worth it. In my Detail. I love it. Love it. Let's see. Leopard Irons. Irons, excuse me. Leopard Irons. I know Mayer is the best player of the best in the country, but do you think he's good enough that Coach Holtz would have thrown him the ball Keep up the great work, fellas. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm just going to give you some data here, all right? When you think of, like, all the great tight ends. There were some great um, tight ends there when Lou Holtz was oh there. Oh, my gosh. Yes, okay. yes. So I'm, I'm going to give you – this is a this is a great comment. And I love – I love – that's, like, a perfect Irish breakdown, like, um, <laughs> level of, like uh, – like, sarcasm there that i just i'm all for i, I just absolutely <laughs> absolutely love i am all here for that but let's think about this they had so herb smith was a, a first round pick right i'm gonna try yeah. to pull up Notre Dame's first round they had herb smith was a first round pick eric brown was a first round pick right and i'm gonna let me just pull up this draft history website here real quick and find the Notre Dame guys so if you look at the tight ends that were drafted under the coach in the coach coach holtz era so you had Pete Kriplevitz, right? He oh, was he was he Kripp was drafted in 1997. So I'm just trying to find all these all these guys stats just so you guys can understand. He was a 5th round pick. And then obviously Herb Smith was a first round pick. You had Derek Brown was a first round pick and back to back years Notre Dame had top 20 picks at tight end. And then they also had Oscar McBride who was not drafted but he spent some time in the NFL and he was a starting tight end. I was giving him a hard time watching him uh have a great block against Florida State. Oscar in his career had 18 catches for 140 yards. Career. Right? Right. First career. Pete Kriplevitz had 48 catches for 580 yards in his career. His last his best year was 27 catches, 331 yards, which was actually better than Irv Smith's best best year. <laughs> Irv Smith's best season at Notre Dame. He had here here's Irv Smith's four years at Notre Dame. One catch for six yards, one catch for six yards. Six catches for 86 yards, 20 catches for 262 yards and two touchdowns, and he was a first-round NFL draft pick. <laughs> Derek Brown, also a first-round NFL draft pick. He had more production overall, but never a big, big season. In 88, he had 12 catches for 150 yards, three touchdowns. In next year, 13 catches for 204 yards. Next year, 15 catches for 220 yards. The next year, he had 22 catches for 325 yards and four touchdowns. He was a first-round NFL draft pick. And then you compare that to old Michael Mayer. Mm -hmm. Right. So for his career, Irv Smith had 62 catches. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me. For his career, Derek Brown, who was the most productive tight end of that group during the time, 
had 62 catches for 899 yards and eight touchdowns. Michael Mayer in 2021 had 71 catches for 840 yards and seven touchdowns. So he had he had more career production than 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 uh, Pete Kerplevitz and Irv Smith. He had twice as many yards and catches in one year as Irv Smith had his entire career. And and he had more catches and and fewer yards than than Dirk Brown had a first career, but only by 59 yards and only one fewer touchdown in one season. So yeah, the offense is a little bit more tight end friendly than it was for Coach Holtz. And that's one of the things, and I love that Le- Le- Leopard uh, that Leopard Iron said that because you know there's this thought that you know Notre Dame produced great tight ends, and they did. They just didn't throw them the ball a lot. And now when they did, they they had some big plays. They didn't throw them the ball a lot. So uh, love love that comment and appreciate the, the kind words. And, and it was funny. I put a thing out, a tweet out yesterday, and, and it was about Michael Mayer, and it was a, a draft preview by – by Ryan. And it was like, you know, Michael Mayer has a chance to be the nation's best tight end this year. And there were people that are like real salty about that. He already was the best time. Like, okay, you may think so. I may think so, but there's a lot of people that don't outside right. of the Notre Dame universe, which speaks to that bubble that I had. And it's like, you can we'll disagree with me and not be a, right? not be a, not be childish about it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, he's already the best tight end. Oh, that's debatable. Was a third team all American. Wasn't a finalist for the John Mackey awards. Right. So clearly there's some people a lot of people think he was the best tight end. And I also think that thought process takes away from the fact that there's actually still room that Michael Mayer can get better, which is oh, yeah. a really scary thought for the rest of college football. Like a better version of Michael Mayer, right? You know, yeah. 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 And, and and David Knight said this, you know, Derek Brown was a physical specimen and really got the ball. Derek Brown was six seven. He's from the Miami, six seven and athletic. That David is absolutely correct on that. He was a a physical specimen and a heck of a player, but he just just never got the ball. He never got the ball. And Jabari Holloway was was a was a later. He was not part of the Lou Holtz era. He came he came a little bit later. But how about that? Pete Kripp Levitz had more had a better individual season and better than than Derek Brown or or Irv Smith ever did. Funny stuff. Yeah. Man, funny it's stuff. Option football for you, buddy. Yeah. All right. Go. Well, I hate Jordan- it. <laughs> You're a tight end at heart. Uh, Jordan Schreiber says, can Tommy Reese do the same thing Phil Longo did with North Carolina with Sam Howell putting up big numbers along with a thousand yard receivers plus two 1000 yard running backs? Uh, I don't think so. I, I don't think number one, Notre Dame's going to play a tougher schedule than North Carolina played. I mean, North Carolina plays a full ACC schedule plus relatively soft, you know, season otherwise. It's also a different offense. I mean, it, it's a it's a more tempo offense. It's an offense that's geared towards. And, and the thing about the tempo is that you got to think about is like it's it's not necessarily going to run more plays because they don't always run more plays, but they run a lot. You know, they were sixth in the nation in in total plays in in two thousand and. In 2020, for example, this past year they were down a little bit because they weren't as good. But in 2020, right. when they had the 2,000 yard runners in in Michael Carter and Javante Williams, this is the one he's talking about. You had Deami Brown, who was a thousand yard receiver, and then Sam Howe, who was a a 3,000 yard passer quarterback. You know, they 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 were six in the nation of plays. That, that's that's a lot of plays. Lot and of plays. if you look at Notre Dame this past year, see Notre that. Dame was 43rd in total plays. So. And even, you know, so I just, when I, when I look at it, it's one of those things, Jordan, where it's just a different type of offense. Number one, number two, when you look at that production at the running backs for, for that year, I'm pulling up the, the numbers. There was like, nobody else got carries. And that, that's the other thing that you, you have to look at as well. So when you look at the rushing production from 2020, uh, Michael Carter had 1,245 yards. Javante Williams had 1,140 yards, which is insane, by the way. The next highest guy was Sam Howell with only 146 yards. The next guy after that was had 99 yards. So they only averaged 235 yards a game. Only. That's really good. But that's 30 right. fewer than what Notre Dame had in 2017. The difference is, is in 2017, Notre Dame split those carries between like five different guys. Right. And, and to me, that's a bit of a difference. And, and so, like, for example, this year, could if you were to tell me that between Tyler Buckner, Chris, Chris Tyree, Audric Estime, Jadarian Price, and then whenever Logan Diggs gets back being healthy, 
if you were to tell me that Notre Dame's going to average the same number of rushing yards that that North Carolina had in 2020, would I believe it? Yeah, I'd believe it. I just really? don't think all the yards are going to be in two guys. Number one, you're going to have a quarterback that's going to take away some of the yards. Right. So, like when you look at 2020, for example, George, and this is a this is a great question, by the way. When you look at it in 2020, Javante Williams had 1140. That was in 11 games, right? You know, it was a COVID shortened year. They didn't play in the bowl game, right? So you add two more games to that. At his yards per game, he'd have been around 1350 for the year if you add two more games. Michael Carter was a 1245. He was like 113 a game. So you could add, you know, he'd be around like 1470, right? Those are really good production. But at least at least one of those guys is going to get like five, six hundred yards taken away, if not a couple of them, five, six hundred yards taken away just by the quarterback. Because Sam Howe that year only had 146 yards. Tyler Buckner's going to run for at least 500 yards, in my opinion, next year. I mean, and that could be low, but I think he goes for at least 500. I mean, that's what Ian Book did. And Tyler and Ian was just a pure scrambler. Like all his yards came off scrambles. Tyler will have some scramble yards, but he's also going to have some designed run yards. Ian was not good on the read zone. Tyler is really good on the read zone. So that's going to factor into it too, Jordan. Is just And then that doesn't even include the, the next highest running back only had 99 yards. So the third running back had 99 yards. There's no way in heck that Notre Dame's third running back in 2022 is only going to have 99 Absolutely. yards. Yeah, agreed. So that's the reason it's going to be challenging. You know, could Tommy Reese do it? I guess if he wanted yeah. to force it but i just don't think that's gonna that's gonna be the best thing for notre dame now could they have a thousand yard rusher an 800 yard rusher and a thousand yard receiver that's possible sure. that's possible but again i think when you look at north carolina that year they throw the ball they threw the ball a ton right but the other thing is they had only two guys over 350 yards receiving it was like it was one a thousand ninety nine by Deami Brown. Daz Newsom had six eighty four, and then after that it was like three thirty seven, three hundred five, two sixty seven, two fifty five. I mean, you're you're going to have the ball spread between more than two guys in, in this offense. I mean, the the backs are going to touch the ball as North Carolina's did. You're you're going to have Lorenzo Styles, Avery Davis, Braden Lindsey. You know, right. potentially Deion Colsey, potentially Tobias Merriweather, potentially Joe Wilkins, the tight end. You know, all those – it's just – I just think the ball is going to be spread around more where a ton of the production for North Carolina that year was given to four guys. The two running backs, Deami Brown and Daz Newsom, And, you know, and Daz Newsom had six, only 684 receiving yards, you know, but he he also was a punt returner, and a, you know, and, and that kind of thing. But, like, a lot of the production was, was on offense was between four guys. Right. And really three guys plus Daz Newsom is really the better way to say it. With Notre Dame, I just think the ball is going to be spread around a ton more, and that's the reason that I that I don't think Notre Dame would do that, be able to do that. And and again, because they're not a tempo offense, they're more about efficiency and explosiveness. We've talked about that. You know, precision over tempo is more of Tommy Reese's thing. I think that's going to be another another aspect of it as well. All right, Toe Jam nineteen ninety two is a good year. Brian, what are the most accurate descriptions for the style of offense and defense we will be running next year? What's a it, it really fits really well to the question that we just had. We were kind of talking right. about that. Notre Dame's offense is a uh, is what I like to call it. It's a pro style spread offense. Right. The spread refers more to how they line up. The pro style refers more to what they run. Right. So inside outside zone, you're going to have some quarterback reads because they're going to take advantage of the quarterback being an athletic player that can take some of that pressure off of the, the typical run game. Right. And, you know, you're going to have inside zone, outside zone. We're going to have some counters we'll probably have a, I would like to see them bring back the buck sweep that worked so well yeah. uh, with chip long in 2017. I think they went away from it because that requires a lot of, I mean, Vince, you know, this, that pin and pull stuff requires really good coaching. You have to, you know, angles are so important and all that kind of stuff. All yeah. of that is yeah. How do you react if this guy goes high? How do you react if this right. guy goes low? All right. that type of stuff. You have to have some athleticism at the guard position that they did not have last year at one of those spots. And, and so I, they they did some movement stuff in, in 20 that was effective. But even then, it was it was because you had some veteran guys. I, I think we'll see a little bit more diversity in the run game this year from, from that standpoint. But it's still very much pro-style stuff, right? 
the pass game is going to be is is what we saw late in the year last year right. was a much better combination of horizontal and vertical stretches. A horizontal stretch is actually for the four verts play is actually a horizontal stretch because right? you're you're right. defending you're you're spreading the defense out horizontally. Right. Flood concepts where like a, you have a post route and you have a deep in cut or dig. It can be from same side or both side, and then you have a cross. That's called that's what we call like levels. That's a vertical. You're stretching the defense vertically, right? And so it can sound confusing, but that's that's what it is. And so we saw early in the year just a ton of horizontal stretch, just a ton of horizontal stretch, and not a not a lot of creativity. I think part of that was a line related, as the coach Reese got more confident in the play of the offensive line. Jack Cohn was getting more time. You saw Brian Kelly kind of back out because Brian Kelly was a big vertical horizontal stretch guy. Chip Long pretty much just ignored him as much as he could and did some different things like that. Tommy Reese had more freedom to do that stuff second half of the year, and that's why we saw the offense play a lot better. Not just not just because they played bad teams. They schematically were things they were doing that were more effective. So we saw Tommy Reese doing things like using a, a, a post route as a clear out to bring Kevin Austin you know, on a deep drag and then using another, you know, using Michael Mayer on like an out cut to get that defender. So you, so you had Michael Mayer and Brayden Lindsay on one side, right? And Brayden Lindsay runs a post to take away the deep coverage. Then Michael Mayer runs a 10 yard out cut to either freeze that corner or to take that linebacker with him. And then you'd have Kevin Austin coming from the backside and he's climbing right into that zone behind Michael Mayer or behind Michael Mayer in front of Brayden Lindsay, right? Like that is that is a you're you're using now now if you get a one on one you may bang that that one you know that throw to Michael Mayer and if right. if you see you know zero coverage you can still bang that post to Brain Lindsay but the the the, the, th the throw is designed to say hey let's get this going so we can open up this clear route to Kevin Austin banged it early in the game against Georgia Tech right so that I think it was the concept I just described they had another one against Stanford early in the game where they're you're seeing Kevin Austin their their best receiver getting wide open on stuff. That's partly bad defense, but that's partly great play design. So we saw more of that, a lot of NFL stuff. You know, there's there's a lot of triangle concepts. We saw a lot more of that. RPOs became much more a part of what they do. So uh, that's where I say pro style, a, a pro style spread offense. Defensively, I don't really know what they're going to be next year. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident they're going to be a four down defense. I can still feel very confident saying that. I think we'll see some different looks. I think from what I'm told, a lot of what they're doing defensively in practice, they did not do in the blue goal game. So uh, for obvious reasons. And so I'm not going to get into what we saw because I would like to still have people that talk to me at Notre Dame. That's a good thing. But uh, it, it's going to it's gonna look a lot different in a lot of different ways. And, and a lot of it's going to be personnel related. You know, they have weapons at linebacker this year, mainly Maris Lewifow that they didn't have last year. You've got J.D. Bertrand in a position. I think he I think he will end up at Mike. I think he'll be better there than he was at Will. Prince Colley's ready to play. So you have a lot more length and athleticism at linebacker this year than you did last year. So I think that that you're going to see Coach Golden have more kind of toys to play with. You know, beginning of last year, there was no Ramon Henderson at safety. There was no Xavier Watts at safety. So there's right. just a lot more toys to play with for Al Golden than what Marcus Freeman had at the beginning of last season. And so – you know that there's, there's um, there, it's it's going to look a lot different. There's going to look a lot different. I, I will. I know this isn't the answer to the question, but the defense is going to be fast and athletic. Like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I see from the defense. You know what I mean? And, and I know that doesn't answer the question, but it's going to be so much fun to watch this defense. I'll say mm -hmm. that. <laughs> we got a. We have a super chat from we have a couple. Weiss, uh, our our guy Zachary Whitfield's in the uh, in the chat. You know, so uh, Charlie gotcha. Weiss's last belt loop is trying to see if we can send him a, a fan application. So be nice. Be nice, everybody. <laughs> and, then, and then we had another super chat. Uh, I want to get here from from your boy. Just your just your ordinary Joe. Your uh, guy Joe. Nice. He says, uh, thank you for the super chat, by the way. He says, what characterizes programs that have great quarterback development? What features or activities are in common among them? And how does what Tommy and D do compare it's a deep question very good question and if you know joe you would expect nothing uh, less nothing less absolutely so joe for me the great the great quarterback developers have a process that they believe in right and the process doesn't change no matter who your quarterback is now 
if you look at like Lincoln Riley, for example, who I thought did a pretty good job developing quarterbacks at Oklahoma, the offense he ran with Baker Mayfield compared to Kyler Murray had a lot of different variations, right? Like there was more quarterback runs with Kyler Murray because he's a more dynamic athlete where Baker didn't. You know, Kyler's a more dynamic overall player. And so they took advantage of that. And so then you look at how, but they were both incredibly successful. Then Jalen Hurts shows up, right? And then he has success doing what he does. And then you say, okay, well, man, they just, they keep pumping out these quarterbacks and, and it, you know, tinkering with the system and this, that, and the other thing. But there's a process in that whole thing that, that, that they stick with that works for them. And there's certain principles, there's way that you process reads, there's way that you process information, there's focus on fundamentals and technique and getting guys to play the game the right way. There's balancing, making sure this guy really understands all the intricacies of the offense without putting too much on him. And I think that right there, that right there was always the biggest problem under Brian Kelly. He put so much on the shoulders of the quarterback. Like they had to know, like and people ask, you know, what, what was so complex about it? I'll give you an example. We've, we've used this before. You could have a guy line up at receiver and depending on what the defense does, he got three to four different options. And I'm not talking about like how I would teach it and how other coaches teach it, where I've got a corner route, but if the guy plays deep, I'm going to kind of bend it at a 45 kind of degree angle to fall underneath that cover two corner and, you know, over top of cover two corner, but also, you know, underneath the cover two safety. If if that guy's playing man coverage, I may stick it and take it high, right? If 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 the corner's bailing and the safety's also may, you know coming up, I'm I'm gonna have to break it off at a different route. And there may be times where you completely change it to an out cut, right? But it's the all within the same framework of that particular route. What I'm referring to, that's not what I'm talking about. That's something most coaches teach. What I'm referring to is he may run a corner, he may run a post dig. He may run a slant or he may run a post route, depending on what they do. That's four completely different concepts based on what the coverage is. So if you're the quarterback, you don't really know what he's doing until you see where he's – because you may think he's supposed to do this, but if you're not sure what he's going to do, you're going to be a little less likely to hold on to that football or to let go of that football on time because you're you're throwing a corner out and he's running a post route, and and you're going to have some uncertainty. And that's part of the issue that Ian Book had. The other part is he just – he wasn't a guy that was really good at – at processing information, if we're being if we're being completely honest with you, but you know, you you look at it. There was a lot of full field reads. Where at Oklahoma, it's once you've made your pre snap read, you got one two. I mean, it's, you're going here to here. I mean that that's it. It's not super complex. Maybe a third, but it's it's all here. You know, or here here backside post, right? Like that kind of thing, Vince. Right? Like stuff that you know you could teach at a. It, at a smaller school or things like that, like quarterbacks can do. Like you're reading this, but if that safety comes down, you know that you got that backside post, so we can go, we can go bang it back to right. And and that's not, I mean, it, it's not super complex. You you have some protection stuff. The Notre Dame quarterbacks have to know. So if they do this, we make this check. If they do this little thing, we make that check. If they do this thing, we got to make that check. And it can be sort of overwhelming. You can, yeah. And and, and and that's a reason why, for a lot of Kelly's career, their best seasons were with first-year starters at quarterback. Because they had to – Dumbed it down. I mean, right. for Black had to. Term, but, you know. Had to. Had to. You had yeah. to. You had to lessen the playbook. You had to lessen the responsibility of the quarterbacks. You just let the kids play. Right. And that's also why every kid regressed the further he was into the system because they put they more and more and more on. As opposed to them just getting better at what they were doing. Right. Now, my – and here's the interesting thing. So – Tommy Reese gets a lot of flack for quarterback development, which I understand. I don't think it's necessarily accurate, though. And allow me to make my case. Number one, he had Brandon Wimbush really for a year or two years. Brandon Wimbush was ruined by the time Tommy Reese showed up. And Tommy at the time was like 25 years old. It was really his first full-time coaching job. Okay? And Brandon Wimbush was a completely different kind of type of quarterback that Tommy Reese had ever worked with. I mean, he, he, he himself – Brandon wasn't like Everett by that point in time. Mike Sanford ruined Brandon Wimbush, ruined him mentally, mechanically, and every way possible as a quarterback. I can't expect a 25. I couldn't have fixed that at 25. I feel like I could have fixed it, you know, after coaching for a number of years, but I couldn't have fixed that in my first year as a coach. And I think Tommy Reese could probably do a better job fixing that now that he has a little bit, you know, five years of experience under his belt. But since Brandon Wimbush, 
we've seen Ian Book have success that he's had. And, and I'll be honest, I think that Tommy Reese got as much out of Ian Book as there was to get out of Ian Book. Because I don't think the things that Ian struggled with were things that Tommy Reese could fix. Right. If a quarterback doesn't process information well, that's you can make you make it a little bit better, and they did. But you can't necessarily fix that. Some kids just can't. Not everybody can read a defense like Joe Montana could. It just it's just right. a reality. Not everybody can do what Tom Brady did mentally. That's what makes those guys so great. Right. And and so. With him, I think he got the most out of Ian Book. And now, Ian didn't necessarily improve because his best year was his first year. But I think part of the reason his year, his first year was the best year is that was probably the most talented team he was a part of offensively, if we're being honest. You had you know, Dexter Williams at running back. You had Alizé Mack at tight end. You had Chase Claypool. You had Miles Boykin. You had Chris Fink. Those are all NFL players right now. Then you had Kevin Austin off the you know coming off the bench. You had a, you had, the offensive line was still a year removed from Harry Heastan, so they still had a lot of Harry Heastan influence. And, you know, I thought Ian – and Chip Long did a really good job of not asking Ian to do it a lot. I mean, they, I, there was one game, was, I think it was Navy, where Ian Book went like 9 of 9 on RPOs. There was another game he was like 10 of 12 on RPOs. I mean, so he wasn't asking – and then, it, then they el- eliminated RPOs from the offense in 19 and 20. Which is still kind I of weird. Don't understand at all because that, but it was successful in eighteen. Yeah. Or whatever. So, so I I view him like I think he got the most he could out of Ian Book, and then we saw with Jack Cohn last year, he was making a, tra- a transition from being an under center quarterback at Wisconsin to a shotgun quarterback at Notre Dame. Right. I think early Jack had some. Jack had a bad line. He was getting used to playing with those guys. The offense was being somewhat bastardized by Brian Kelly because he still wanted to have his say. And you had a fact that Jack was still making the mechanical adjustments to the footwork of avoiding pressure under as a shotgun quarterback compared to under center. You hear it every year during the draft. You get these shotgun guys that they're like, hey, watch this guy try to throw from a drop back. He, he can't do it. He's still learning it, right? Well, and that's what Jack was going through. But if you look at it, Jack got better and better and better and better and better throughout the year. Great. Here's another thing I like. I think Tommy Reese can be a little too hard sometimes on quarterbacks. I thought that early in his career, especially because he, you could coach him hard. Like Tommy, you could, because Tommy would give it right back to you. I mean, there's how many times do we see Tommy and BK kind of going at it on the sideline when Tommy was a quarterback? Because he's a very confident kid. He could take hard coaching. And sometimes when you're a young coach, you're going to coach kids how you like to be coached or how you could be coached. And I think, and we saw, we heard something last year where Jack Cohn went up to Tommy Reese and was like, hey, Come at me like you win at so and so, like you win at Ian, because he, you know, Jack's a quiet kid. He's not a real, like, intense kid. Like, you know, you you and you worry about kids like that, and he always kind of has this, like, you know, he's got those bright eyes. You just you, you're like, okay, I don't know how hard can I push this right. kid. And so Tommy didn't go at him as hard right away. That tells me he's being thoughtful about, okay, I want to make sure I don't break this kid. Right. And then you have Jack comes and says, hey, I want you to push me. Okay. And, and then you realize, then you realize, okay. His dad's a cop. He's 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 a lot tougher than I thought. Maybe you know, mentally tougher than I thought. Okay, let me go at him, and then you know, and then you develop him that way. So that showed me that he understands. You can't treat every single kid the same. You treat them all fairly, but you can't treat them the same. Every kid's going to respond to different cues. Every kid learn. Sometimes if you yell at a kid, his ears shut because he had a an abusive parent or an abusive coach or. Sure. Or a, or a, you know, some kind of t- tough life where when a male figure starts screaming at him, he just shuts down. Yep. I, I had a situation like that. And my best receiver one year was that kind of kid where my other top receiver was uh, his dad, I think was a drill sergeant. That's all he knew. So like I had to treat those two kids real different. They were I treated them both fairly, but how I communicated with one guy was completely how I communicated with a different guy. That's part of the process of learning. I think Tommy's getting that. So, and, and I think the technique is good. Like I've never watched their names quarterbacks the last couple of years. I'm like, man, their footwork sucks or man, they, you know, their, their release point sucks, or this is different, or that's weird, or the, the other thing. And so I'm going to be honest with you, I, I actually like the job Tom Reese has done. I wouldn't call it a great job yet because we need to see the production get better. It's a year for him. But I think I think that also, I think he has very firm convictions on on how to coach a quarterback. Now, I don't I don't know like every single little detail of that, but I do believe there's firm convictions, and I, and I like that. I think you have to have firm convictions in what you believe in because otherwise you – and I think that's what hurt Mike Sanford. I don't think deep down Mike Sanford had convictions as a coach. And so when you watch some coach, Vince, it was like he's just grab. Like I saw this at a clinic. I saw that at the thing. Oh, this guy does this, and it was just grab bagging. It was like what? 
do you even know what that drill's doing? Because number one, the drill's stupid. Number two, you're not doing it right. I mean, that's what I came away from. We had this conversation walking out of a practice one day. I was like, did you watch the drills Mike Sam's doing with the quarterbacks? What the freaking heck was that about? Like, that was a, the, that was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, just – and then you see the play of the quarterbacks. Like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it now, right? <laughs> so, um, it, it, it's consistency, attention to detail, pushing them to the point where you've max, where, 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 where they know as much as they can, but then not going past that point where you overwhelm them. I think all those are very important pieces. We're getting some great questions today. We're getting some really can good I, questions, but that was a really I, good one as well. There's a good question here coming up about Everett Golson. And sure. um, I, I want to transition to that. Yeah. And, and I want to talk about Brandon Wimbush because, you know, you talked about how, how Mike Sanford ruined Wimbush, et cetera, et cetera. I remember telling somebody when Wimbush was coming in that, man, I think this kid might be one of the better quarterbacks in Notre Dame history. Like I thought that he had the tools to be, you know, to throw it, to run it, to do all of these different things. I was so excited about Brandon Wimbush only to be disappointed by the way he was coached and used and ruined for, you know, to use your term. I mean, it, it that was that, that might be one of the more disappointing outcomes yeah. of my life following Notre Dame football, yeah. you know, from a guy that I was really excited about. Well, here's a question that just popped up, Vince, and this is from Josh Buffo, the motivational yes. business banker. Yes. What was the biggest waste of talent in Notre Dame? I mean, Brandon's in that conversation yeah. for me. Yes. Phil is too. Yeah. That's but a good call. Brandon, Brandon is is in that conversation because and David, David Knight brought this up earlier. I mean, go back and watch Brandon Wimbush against IMG Academy as a senior. He's playing at IMG in the rain and he compl- and he passed for over 400 yards. Right. At IMG Academy. Right. Right now, IMG wasn't quite what it is now at that time, but it was really good. Still, they had dudes, and and you watch him on national TV against Bergen Catholic, and he's just embarrassing Jared Garantano. I mean, just shredding him, just ball placement, just playing great. And then I remember I had a conversation with one of the newer coaches, and I don't know if I've said the name before in the past. I don't know if I've told the story in the past, but I remember having this conversation, and this guy was like, just really being man, man, this kid really struggles. How's this? This kid, Wimbush, really struggles throwing the football. And and his mechanics are this, that, and the other. And he's like, I, how'd that kid end up at Notre Dame? And I'm like, dude, you don't even understand. Right. And I said, go back and watch his high school film. And he's like, man, I said, go back and watch his high school film. And he did. And he came, he called me up. He's like, dude, that I don't know who that kid is. Like, that kid I just watched on film, that's not the guy we got. Right? So somebody had screwed him up. And that's what he said. Somebody screwed that kid up. And it was Mike Sanford is who it was. So, yeah. It's I mean, disappointing for me. I, yeah. I was so excited about Brandon coming in. I mean, oh, gosh. He was he, so and good. of course, and this is just adding to it, really, is his makeup as a human was fantastic. You know what I mean? He's a right. great kid. And we see that now with what he's doing after school. But uh, I, that was just so disappointing for me yeah. overall. And somebody asked what we mean by ruined. Uh, it's a good, fair, very fair question. Absolutely a fair question. His mechanics were, uh, they changed his throwing motion. Right. Change his throwing, like dramatically change his throwing motion, and he never got comfortable with it. And it shattered his confidence. It, it, it hurt his release point. He couldn't control the ball. Right. His release point stunk. He couldn't. He couldn't find that. Like so, to me, like we were talking about this with a pitcher in a, in a uh, quarterback yesterday. Like where a quarterback will get to a funk, and he's got to get himself out of it. But you're getting yourself out of because you 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 can get back to your happy place, right? Like you get back to your yeah. sweet spot. Where, right. Like oh, that felt good. Right, like you ever been? I mean, you're a baseball guy, Vince. You ever get in a batting cage? Like, man, he's. I'm just like I'm. I'm not feeling my swing doesn't feel right, right. today. Yeah. And then you do make, and then you're like, oh, okay, okay. There we go. I, I'm assuming golf is that way. I've never actually had a sweet, sweet swing as a golfer. <laughs> like I hack at it, but I mean, I'm assuming golfing the same way. Anytime that you have some sort of a thing where your whole body works together to accomplish a task, uh, basketball shooting, that's another right. one. Man, my shot feels off today. Like I'm missing it in my, and then you, you're like, okay, let me get my mechanics back and then I'm good to go. And then, okay. Yeah, that felt good. It, it feels good when you get back to it. But when you change a guy's mechanics, like Brandon, and he gets out of whack, there's no happy place to go back to because you've taken the happy place away. You've taken the sweet spot away. It, his footwork was ignored basically for two years until Tommy Reese showed up and uh, his confidence was shattered because they right. were just, I mean, just the way that Brian Kelly interacts with quarterbacks. Right. You, you Like, you know, and he came from – Brandon came from a great program at St. Peter's Prep. He knew he was – like, this doesn't make any sense. 
right? Like it was, it was just all of it, confidence, mechanics, throwing motion, all that stuff. And so that's what we mean by ruined, right? And and so, and here's the thing, if you're not comfortable with your throwing motion, you're, you're always thinking about it, which makes it harder to read a defense. And so th- that's what we mean by ruined is just mechanics were thrown off, throwing motion was changed. You could never get his release point back. He can never, it just, it was always a mess. It was so, always yeah, a mess. So disappointing. And that's why when, when Brandon did make throw a great deep, ball, a, a, a great throw, normally it was a deep ball because that's the one time he could kind of just get back to that happy place and, and let her rip. Right. But even then his accuracy on deep balls wasn't great. Right. But it looked great coming out of his hand sometimes. And so that's what we mean by that. Really, really good, really good follow-up question. That was Ian Johnson asked that follow-up question about what that means. Nice. Nice. And and, and Shane I'm sure O'Shea. He was the only person thinking that. Yeah, no, right, right. Absolutely. Shane O'Shea is he says, What were your thoughts on Everett Golson? I thought he was going to be great. He seemed to have it all. So on Everett, Vince, I don't put as much of that on Brian Kelly. Now, look, they weren't great at developing quarterbacks back then. But Everett kind of made his own bed in a lot of ways. I mean, we talked about this. I, I, Brian Kelly was too hard on quarterbacks. Everett was the exception. I mean, you'd watch him on the side, and he's trying to be calm talking to Everett because he knew Everett was just mentally not a super tough kid. And he'd try to be calm, and, you know, sometimes you, you lose it. But, like, he tried to – he he was way softer on Everett than he was any other quarterback he's ever had. I mean, just – I mean, that was obvious to see. You know, but Everett, Everett was a kid that the team believed in. They rallied around him in 2012, and then he went out and got suspended for 2013 because of his own decisions. Right. No, no one forced him to cheat. No one forced him to, to do what he did. He made that choice, and it got him suspended. He made the choice to go work with George Whitfield. Right. Horrible decision. George Whitfield, to me, is, is not someone I would ever let anyone I know work with as a quarterback coach. I mean, it's all hype. I, very few success stories, in my opinion. I usually see kids work with him, come back, and they're a hot mess. Johnny Manziel went through that. Johnny Manziel regressed after working with George Whitfield. Yeah. And then Everett came back, and somebody had convinced Everett that you're a drop-back passer. And, 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 and he could have been, but you took away – he overly took away his ability to run. And it took away from his game. And then the other thing is Everett wasn't – Everett, I think the time away, Everett not, never got back kind of a rhythm of – like reading, he would make mistakes that you just, you don't expect him to make. Some of them was trying to force stuff. And right. then the final thing is, is you can't have a quarterback that lacks mental toughness because when you have a quarterback that lacks mental toughness, a game like Arizona state can ruin you. And that's what happened to Everett. Arizona state game ruined him. And the pick six, like in, in the thing is it shouldn't have because he played terrible in the first half. They fell behind 34 to three. But he's primarily the reason they got it back to 34-31. It's because he made some phenomenal, phenomenal throws. But, Vince, he just never he never kind of mentally recovered from that. I mean, yeah. he was always a bit of a turnover guy. You know, I mean, he always kind of, you know, he turned up. You're like, oh, like, I was it the game against um, in 2014? It was Syracuse game, right, where he, he completed like 20-some, like 20, like 20-something throws in a row. His That's final right. stat line, 32 of 39 for 362 yards and four touchdowns. He only threw seven interceptions or seven incompletions. Two of them were picks because he just – you're like, what the heck? Like, you just made all those great throws. What what was that? You know, so he always had that in him, but then he had the four picks against Arizona State. And even that next week against Northwestern, he put up good numbers, but yeah. he just – he wasn't the same. He just and, – and by the time you got to the USC game, he was shot, mentally yeah. shot. I don't blame Brian Kelly for that. You got to be tougher than that mentally, and I, and I don't think ever was. I played a place and like I Notre think Dame. He, yeah, yeah. And I mean, he, and he just he, he, that position. Period. Don't get me wrong, but like, but especially at Notre Dame, right. right? It's like kicker. I mean, it's you know, we're, we're, Blake Groupie was a super accurate kicker at Arkansas State. We'll see if he can do that at Notre Dame. It's balls the same Little, size, field the same size, goalpost the same size, crowd ain't the same size, the pressure's not the same size, right? <laughs> right. And exactly. So, it, it's a different animal. So it, it, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see. I think this is a big year for Tom Reese in quarterback development. I, I really do. not agree more. I, and it's I, partly I, why I'm like, confident in this season, Vince. Go I feel ahead. like that's a show for us coming up, just to be sure. putting it out there because we did a. Yeah. Remember, we did a, a Jeff Quinn. This is a big year for Jeff yeah. Quinn offensive line. I feel like not with the same. No. Um, no. Not, with, not in the same vein, 
But right. I also feel like this is a big year for Tommy Reese and the quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. what we said last year was like all the all the Harry Eastman guys are gone. All the guys that Harry coached and all that, that that he was the primary driver for, they're gone. We're going to find – this is going to be your line. And we're we going to find out. out what it's about. <laughs> it was crap. We did. We found out. <laughs> Just saying. We found out. Man. It was I, not good. We, we, it was we found not out. good. Yeah. And, and, and let's get to some more questions here, Vince, before you got to get out of here. Yeah, we'll sounds good. And Max, says, do you believe the NCAA announcing NIL infractions will be retroactive? Will have any effect on how schools utilize it moving forward? I don't think they have any teeth, really, at the moment. Well, I mean, hopefully they can get some. What he's referring to is is there's supposedly like the the, the schools, right, are are pressuring the NCAA to try to start enforcing rules and then make harsh rules, but then make them retroactive. So, like, if you get caught, if if we find if we make these rules and you cheated, we're gonna hammer you for it. Really like the problem I mean, is. They're like severely that. understaffed in that regard, so they're going to have to commit more resources to it. And the other part is, I just don't think they have the cojones to to do anything right. about it. I think I think this is all for show. I think this is this this is the schools because again, here's the thing: the schools can do something about it. If you care, hey, you know, because here's the problem: the schools that aren't doing that don't want to do anything about it are the ones cheating, right? Right. Absolutely. But if USC's president or AD cared about the rules, he called Blinken right. Hey, this better stop. Right, and if any, if, if what I hear about what Jordan Addison is going on, then you know, you, you, you you're Man. we're gonna be the ones to deal with this. They don't up. care. Yeah, exactly. like if, if Georgia, if the people, the leaders at Georgia or Alabama or Tennessee cared about the rules and the respect, they would do something about it within their own program. Clean up your own freaking program. That's the thing is, we can talk about the NCAA all we want, but the at the end of the day, the NCAA is made up of member schools and sure. people from the schools. And I'm so sick of people in America at every at all the leadership, whether it's politics or whether it's schools or coaches or whatever else, always looking for somebody else to fix a freaking problem that they can fix. Right. Hey, SEC. Right. Because the, the clown from the SEC is one of the people going to Congress to have them do something. Here's what you can do. Get all the flipping presidents into a Zoom call and say, hey, fellas, if you guys don't f- clean up your own situations, we're this is the Congress is going to get involved, and this is not going to go well for us. Or the NCAA is going to do this, or this is going to do that. Where's your moral backbone? Or, or is winning and making money all you care about? Then say that. Don't, don't, let's stop pretending that you give a crap about students at that point in time. Right. Right. But come on, say it. University of Tennessee's leadership, the AD, the president, all of them could do something about what's going on at Tennessee, at Bama, at Georgia, at USC, but they don't because they're cowards and they don't care. Or they don't care, maybe both. Because at the end of the day, they just want to make money. Right. USC's leadership could stop what's going on right now like that. Hey, Lincoln, here's the deal. You you keep doing this. This is against the rules. Here's the rules the NCAA currently has. What you're doing is not right. Okay? So if you if you have any inkling that a booster is being involved in something, you, let, you tell that kid we can't recruit you anymore, and you let that booster know you're the reason we can't have this kid anymore. Right? And stop right, and then you go report what's going on because you know right. they they won't, right? And so at the end of the day, that's the reality of it. They, because again, they don't care, right? Like, oh, this is what I have to do to win. At what point in time is doing the right thing more important than winning? And yep. that's the problem. Some people are like, as long as he's making his money, I, I get so sick of that, and I have no sympathy for that, right? Because making money, there's one of the greatest things I heard when I was a kid. Is a story that I was I was actually told this in church. It's kind of kind of funny when I was a kid. It was like there's this really really wealthy guy, right? And he was dying, and he was in, in his you know in his basement. And um, I'm trying to remember uh, trying to remember the, the story, but basically he put all he put all his stuff you know all his all his belongings up in the roof because he thought you know when he would die that he'd be able to take him with him, right? That kind of thing. And you know forget how the story goes, but you know basically he went he went the opposite direction. <laughs> You know what I mean? But the point is like, look, at the end of the at the end of the day, none of the stuff goes with you. At the end of the day, all that really matters is your character. You know, all the stuff you've achieved at the end of the day, like the difference you make in people's lives, your character, the the that that's all that matters. And people, you know, winning and losing, because it's just that that's important. I'm not saying it's not important, but it should never, it should never be more important than your character. Right. And that's why I I have lost all respect for guys like Lincoln Riley, because you know what you're doing is wrong. He doesn't care. Cause it's just, it's about me and you know, that's, that's, I just got no use for that. Right. You know, let's bring in Ryan Roberts to, and I got to get rid of this USC guy. 
So oh. <laughs> um, I've, I've put up with it enough. <laughs> You're at the bottom. You get to see all the fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ryan, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. What's up, guys? I I, uh, I thought that uh, wait for him was on me, Brian. I thought you were saying not to bring no. him to the show. <laughs> no. Oh. no. I know. No, I, no, I was going to come in and guy. be like, is, is this a Blake Groupie slander going on in here? NCAA slander, man. There's a lot of slandering going on here. Yeah. You just got rid of mm-hmm. our USC guy. So. Yeah, can't believe you. you. Can't gotta believe go, you. gotta go, <laughs> gotta go. All right, I will so. throw this one up for you guys and let you guys take care of it because it is a recruiting question, kind of. Notre Dame two one six four says if we land Houston and Jason Moore and keep all of our current recruits, best defensive line class coming out of high school at Notre Dame since. Would you? Would you? <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, would you? Would you go all the way to like the yeah, like the Eshack? Well, that's a good, to it I mean, you, you, it would definitely be better than the 2016 class if they get more in Houston. And 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 here's right. why, Ryan. The DN mm-hmm. class they got in 2016 was really good. And you had Dalen Hayes was a five-star at the time. Khalid Cream was a top 250 guy. Julian Aguara, I thought, was a top 200 guy. I gave Adi Ogandiji a four-and-a-half-star upside grade. I, I really liked him coming out of high school. But he was just – he was 210 pounds and needed to develop and all that kind of stuff. But they were all ends. I mean, they all played two positions. It's kind of like what we've said about Texas A&M last year. Now, it was, they had a great DN rotation, but that's why you were kind of going to battle with like guys that weren't on the same level as defensive tackles all the time. And then you had the you know you had Jerry Tillery in 2015, but then that year they only signed defensive tackles. They signed him, Brandon Tiasa, Mike Do Treadway, and you didn't sign and Elijah Taylor, but you didn't sign any edge players. You did Bo Wallace, but he didn't make it into school, and so. I think I think this would actually be the best class. It would even be better than 2011, and I think, but I think that's where the debate would be, Ryan. And here's why I say, I think you could make a case it's better. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. I don't think the top is as good as it was in 11. And Keon Keeley to me is every bit as good as Aaron Lynch, maybe even a, a touch better. I don't think that Jason Moore is quite as good as Stefan to it was the same age. Now, part of it is because Stefan had a really advanced game coming out of high school where Jason, like you said yesterday, still a, a raw developing player from a technical standpoint. He's close, but not quite. And then, you know, the third guy, let's say it's whether it's Bubakar, or Brennan Vernon. I don't know if they are where Ishak was coming out of high school. I don't know if the top three is quite as good as the top three, but it's close. It's in the conversation. Yeah. But here's the deal. That class inside was not nearly as good. You had Tony Springman, you had Brad Carrico. Uh, it, it, you, it was an edge. It was an, another edge case. Now you had some inside guys. You also had Anthony Rabasa in that class, who was a you know out, an edge guy as a three four outside linebacker. But the inside was not nearly as good. Whereas what I love about this class, Ryan, and this is something we talked about yesterday, this class is different because this class hits it all. You've got a guy that I think could be a, a, a really outstanding nose in this defense. You've got two guys at least that can be big ends and two guys that can be big ends or inside, right? So you got Keon's the Viper. Devin Houston is a nose to three. But between Bubakar, Jason Moore, and Brennan Vernon, that's three guys really that could either be big ends or three techs. So you got five guys that can play together in, in different combinations. That's what makes this group, in my opinion, even be- different, and I would say better, because at the end of the day, it's not about recruiting rankings or necessarily landing the three best players. It's did you get a combination of guys that when you put the pads on on Saturdays helps you go beat opposing teams? And I think that this group, if they get Jason Moore and if they get Devin Houston, would, in my opinion, I, I have no problem saying it's definitely better than the 2011 class because it's a more balanced class. And then we're saying it's not as good at the top. We're still talking about top 50 to 75 guys, right? But, I mean, Aaron Lynch, Stefan and Ishak Williams are all five-star players. Yeah. yeah. There, there's no – I mean, they were all top 30 guys. This class mm-hmm. would only have one top 30 guy, right? So that's my that's my argument for why I think this class would be better than the 2011 class. Agree, mm-hmm. disagree, what say you, Ryan? Now, I think when you kind of put all parts together, it makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you something because I think there's going to be some people that may have this mindset, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I, we have talked many times. I think Jason Moore could play three tech long term. Mm-hmm. I think that Brennan Vernon could play three tech, maybe even nose long term. I know Devin, I really think that Devin Houston could also be that nose in this system that you're talking about that could be a really 
incredible player. But all these players that Notre Dame is is recruiting are playing majority defensive end on the edge. Mm -hmm. I know there's probably some people out there that are saying, but how do you know that those translate to being interior players? Just curious on your, like maybe your rebuttal to people that maybe question if those guys can make that transition. It'd be the same response when people say, well, how do you know a guy can go from tackle to guard? And here he stands, recruits all these tackles. And how do you know who can snap the ball? Who can you look for certain attributes, right? Right. And I know you know the answer to this, and I appreciate you setting me up to answer it that way. But you look for different things. Can he play with good pad level? Right. Like you can get away with not having great pad levels and edge guy. You, you, it's not ideal, but you can get away with it. You can't have bad pad level inside. You're, you're going to get whipped all the time. I don't care how strong you are, because once those guys who are smaller and not as strong as you get up in your chest and you're stand up, you're, you're going to lose. Right. And and so I think technique you look at the can this guy bend at all right so if i look at jason moore and he's got tight hips and he stands up at the line because he's a you know because look we talk about knee benders versus waist benders on the offensive line it kind of matters on defensive linemen too and if he's a tight knee guy or a tight hipped guy and he's got to play high and say well you know that guy can't go inside but when i do look at jason moore i don't see that i see a kid that can bend i see a kid that's got some flexibility a kid that can get low a kid that can drive his hips a kid that understands plant using his hands now, his technique needs a lot of work, but he's got super long hands. He's got the quickness. He's got the frame. His block destruction shows. So then you got to project a little bit. Okay, can he have the size? Can he do this? Can he do that? And then when you look at a guy like, same thing like Bubakar, same like Brendan Vernon, right? You got to look at their ability to play with proper pad level, their ability to get, get extension with their hands. Because, you know, as an end, a lot of times if you're not great at immediately getting into a guy and then locking out as an end, that may not hurt you a ton, Ryan, because you play at different angles. That is an end. You're playing on the side of a guy. Offensive linemen aren't trying to drive at you the same kind of way. You're coming on a pass rush. You know, you're using all that type of stuff. The contact a lot of times, especially in the pass game, happens later in, in, in a snap for an edge player as an interior player where almost everything as an interior guy is right away. It's all almost right away. And so unless you're doing some kind of loop, right, some kind of movement, Everything happens quickly. So if a guy doesn't have fast hands or strong hands or doesn't know how to use them, all those type of things, and that projection inside isn't going to be as good. So when I look at the kids that we're talking about, Brendan Vernon, Bubakar Traore, Jason Moore, they all have great length. They all know how they all they all understand the need to, to use their hands, even though the technique isn't always there. They all have very strong hands. Right. So like once the technique is there, because it's a teachable skill, in my opinion, if a kid has slow hands. You can do things to improve that. I mean, that's why a lot of you're seeing a lot more modern defense, like NFL defensive linemen working, doing boxing. Aaron Donald's made this famous, but it's a it's really smart. There are drills you can do in boxing to improve the speed of your hands. Now, you're never going to be Mike Tyson from a hand speed standpoint, but you can be faster than what you are. You know, so, so you look at that. Can this guy get better? And, and so those are the things that I look at and say, can a guy better? Can a guy, does a guy have those traits? Can he bend? Can he play low? Does he, can he move his feet through contact? All those type of things. Can he play with power? Can he take on a double team? What's his block destruction like? I think all those things you can see on film and project that, yeah, that guy can go inside. Just like you can project a tackle to be move inside and play guard. But not every tackle we can project to move inside to play guard. And so I think those are things you look for. And I think that's a fair question. And it's the opposite of what we've, what the other question has primarily been, Ryan, where people are asking, like, do you have any true edge guys? So you can look at it both ways. And in both instances, I think the answer is that's partly what I love about this class, because they're they're like, you know, there's so much flexibility and versatility to what these guys can do that you can play them together in some really unique combinations that adds even more value to what I think this group can be. What are your thoughts on that, Ryan? No, no, I, I agree completely. This is my favorite part of, I mean, this is why I got into the NFL draft space to begin with, right? Because I love that projection. And I think that when you're talking about the high school to college level, there's even more projection that is kind of, you know, evident in, in those, in those uh, evaluations that you make of players. So I agree. I think that Devin Houston is an easy one. Like, I think you could see those traits parlaying inside very well. Like, I, I don't think that's an issue at all. Jason Moore is a guy that, the reason that I value length in this class so much for Notre Dame is the fact that you have guys like Brendan Vernon, Jason Moore, Bubakar Triori, that if they all land all three of those, Jason Moore obviously is not in the class at this time, 
you are talking about some length in that spot. And you're talking about guys that I think could project favorably to working inside. Like that's the biggest thing for me with those guys is I think they all have strong hands. I think they all have power elements to them. I think that though they all have developmental traits as mm-hmm. defense linemen. Cause it's like Jason Moore is not going to be six, six two sixty five for the rest of his life. Right. Like right. he's going to put on some weight. <laughs> like he's a 17 year old kid, right? Like he's going, he's going to get bigger. So, and I think it's a fascinating conversation, though, because I, I think that you can make the argument because I remember Aaron Lynch's freshman year at Notre Dame. And I was like, wow, that kid's going to be a top five pick in a couple of years. Like he is incredible. You know, he was he was the headline of that group before he left, you know, and then Stefan Tua right. took over. So I think, though, that you can compare Keon Keeley to Aaron Lynch and say, who's the better prospect? And then mm-hmm. after that, the Stefan Tua might have the edge over a couple of their guys. But the fact that you have a potential four to five man class that can all play together, including interior and outside guys. I think that's what separates this class. So yeah. if so in that element, Brian 2011, they might be best since they might be at least best since 2011. Right. Is there ever a after class that, that you, you got to go back to the nineties. I mean, right. you'd have to go. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to look up the 1990 class. I think I actually have it on my phone. If you give me a second, I think I actually can look up. Is that the Bryant Young that class? Up, cause, 90? Yes, that was the Bryant Young class. Because Jim Flanagan was also in that class. Mm-hmm. Oliver Gibson, Brian Hamilton. I mean, that's your starting lineup for the 93 team. That 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 might be close. But again, I don't know what a lot of those guys were coming out of high school. I can only evaluate. I don't know if Bryant Young was considered an elite target coming out of high school. He may, sure. I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer to that. So it's definitely of the and I like to call it the modern era, which is basically I the the, the recruiting services era, which began in 2002. Mm-hmm. It's it, by far. By far, it would because it, the only one that could compete with it, in my opinion, is 2011. And, and, you know, again, looking at it from a recruiting ranking standpoint, now obviously only one of those guys panned out like a five star, and that was Stefan. But yeah. looking at it from a recruiting ranking standpoint, that that would be the only one that could compete. But I, like you said, the balance of it is 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 really where you want to be. Corey D with a question, Ryan, and, and this is something you kind of talked about with a, a kid from South Dakota State. If you haven't seen that video, go to Ryan's at Rise in Draft, uh, R I S E N Draft, right? Correct, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, and and watch the video Ryan did. He interviewed a, a kid from South Dakota State who talked about Power Five schools offering him money. You had Zay Flowers yesterday. I, I hope Zay Flowers kills it in every game next year, including Notre Dame. But I still want Notre <laughs> Dame to win. I just want him to get his. Right. Yep. Uh, he had schools offering him 300,000, 600,000 to leave. He's not even in the portal. Right. Right. And right. he chose to stay. His dad wanted him to stay like that's that's called being a good it's being a good parent, like be a man of your word. There's a lot more to this than just money. This B.C. degree and all that kind of stuff. I loved hearing that. It's getting disgusting. Corey says, since Saban sought to buy mayor, do you think less of him? So, number one, I don't I doubt that Nick Saban was the one driving that. This isn't to excuse right. Nick Saban. I'm just saying, like he he he's been doing this long enough to know he doesn't have to get his hands dirty, right? He he'll, he'll let right. other people do it. But this yeah. is my issue with Nick Saban, and and, and you know I, I appreciate the fact that Nick Saban is saying so much publicly against all this stuff. He warned that NIL. I found an article the other day that I wrote last April where I said this isn't going to be a thing where this creates parity. This is going to be where the other schools are going to turn into minor leagues for Alabama. And that's exactly what's happening. The best schools are basically picking the best players from the smaller schools. And that's exactly what's happening. At least in the, like somebody asked me, a guy asked me a really good question on, on, uh, on DM today on Twitter. He said, do you think you know, college football is going to turn into major league baseball with, with salary, no salary cap, which means the, the, the big market people. And I said, it's worse than that because in major league baseball, there's tampering rules that get enforced. You can't go talk to a guy while he's still under contract with another school, right? I mean, with another team, you you get hammered for that. There's not that's not being enforced right now in in major in in college football. And so it's it's even worse than that. But here's my issue with Nick Saban. He's saying all the right things. Oh, this NIL is not going to be good, and, and he's not against players getting paid. It's just the, 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 there's no rules. He's against the transfer portal being the way. But then he goes and takes advantage of it, and and you know he steals. You know uh, when Jameer Gibbs entered the portal. I called somebody who's connected with the Georgia Tech program, and I was like, you know, hey, look, what's the deal with Jameer Gibbs? Because I knew someone in coaching that wanted to, that that was interested in him, and you know, wanted to know if I if I knew anything about you know where he was looking. And so I I made the call, and and he's like, oh yeah, he's going to Bama. And so I said, and I said, yeah, this has been it's we've everybody's known that for a month. 
Like, hold on a sec. He just entered the portal like yesterday. So, oh, yeah, it's been a done deal for over a month. It's just like, so at what point in time do you say, well, yeah, it, it, the kid from Louisville, I, every time some so the this kid from Louisville jumps in and, oh, do you think Notre Dame should look at him? Like, guys, as I said before, these kids don't enter the portal to look for schools. They enter the portal as the last step to picking the school that has been recruiting them for a long time, which is yeah. there are rules against that. The NSA just doesn't enforce them. So don't come out here on your high horse talking about how these things are bad for the game. And then you're the best, you're the biggest beneficiary of it. You, What you do is you say to your boosters, hey, we're not taking these kids. I'm putting my foot down. I have seven rings. I don't need to prove anything else. I care about the game that's done so much for me. You're the, you're the primary steward of the game, Nick Saban. So at what point in time are you going to say, hey, I warned people about this. You're the one taking advantage of it. It's like what I said earlier. At what point in time... Does you doing the right thing become more important to you? And, and I've heard people hammer Dabo for this. Oh, that's why Clumps is not as good because he won't take transfer. And I'm like, good, good on him. You're hating on the guy. He's actually saying this is wrong and we're not going to do it. And it's hurting Clemson. And people are hating him on him for it. I'm like, good for you, Dabo, because you're putting your money where your mouth is. I'd rather not win than win that way. And the, the sad thing is we don't have enough people in our country that believe that. Because as long as you're winning, it's okay. And as long as my, it's like politics, right? You you hear these things about, and this is this isn't a political right side left. This is a general statement. You hear these things about how Congress has like a 21 percent approval rating, and yet incumbents win. Not so. It's what it is. It's like I hate politicians, except my guy, right? Our senator, our representative. And that's how it is in sports, too. I hate all these cheaters. Well, except for my coach, because we're winning, right? Like, if USC wasn't doing what they're doing in Oregon was, USC fans would be going, like, all 75 of them would be going crazy right now, right? They'd be losing their minds right now because Oregon's cheating and buying players. But because they're doing, oh, you're just hating because you're not, not winning. I'm not worried about USC. Not worried about USC. It's the game that bothers me. It's you're hurting the game that you that has done. So, you're a millionaire because of this game, Lincoln Riley, and you're crushing it because you have you all you care about is winning, but you're not winning. You're losing because you're setting a horrible example and you're showing yourself you have no moral fiber whatsoever. So Nick Saban can get on his high horse and say all these wonderful things, but then when you go out and do the exact thing you're railing against, simply because while well, everybody else is doing, it, I might as well too. Then then I have no respect for you at that point in time. I have respect for Dabo who's saying, hey, we're not going to do that. I have respect mm -hmm. for Marcus Freeman saying, we're not going to do that. I, I've talked to I've talked to people around Notre Dame when a kid gets in the porter and, and they're like, yeah, the kid's got the kid's got some interest, but we're not playing that game. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. There's but the problem is, right, there's not enough coaches like that. Because hey, I, I got to win to keep my job. Right? Mm -hmm. I got okay. That's fine. So as long as you get to keep your job and make money. It doesn't matter what you do. Right. And, and I just, I have no respect for people like that. And I, I know people say, oh, you're what, I don't care what you say about me. I have no respect for people like that. There's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. And if you're not willing to make the sacrifices, do it the right way. And you're not willing to, to, to say, hey, I'd rather, I'd rather not get this kid than get this kid the wrong way. Then you're a coward. You have no moral backbone. And I don't want to hear what you have to say about the, the things that are ailing college football because you're the problem. And that's mm -hmm. what I would say to Nick Saban. You get off your high horse and either shut up and keep doing what you're doing, or if you're going to speak out, then live it. Live it. Don't talk the talk. Walk the walk. Right? Yep. That's why I got more respect for Dabo Sweeney than I do Nick Saban because Dabo's walking the walk, and he's talking the talk, and it's hurting his program. Yeah. Now, I, I mean – so I, I, I just want to comment real quick on the whole issue here. Cause like you said, I, I just talked to Tucker Kraft, who was a tight end out of South Dakota state, which was, I mean, Brian, I didn't even ask him about the whole NIL thing or whatever. He literally just far, he, I asked him about maybe the fact that you're maybe a little under the radar. And by the way, this kid's a really good player, all American on the FCS level. will will be drafted next year. No doubt about it. Probably the best tight end to come out of FCS football since Dallas Goddard, who also came out of mm -hmm. South Dakota state. So, I asked him, you know, just I feel like you feel like you're underappreciated because you play on the FCS level. And he said, well, yeah, from like the general people. But, you know, this offseason, there were plenty of schools that were offering me six figure deals to come play for their program. And I literally yeah. said, were you in the transfer portal? No. 
wasn't in the transfer portal. People mm-hmm. were just coming at me. And that's where my biggest issue is right now. I think that there is in theory, I mean, not in theory. I like that the players are able to make money off their name. 100%. 100%. 100%. I, I like that they're able to transfer to another school. I have zero issue with the movement. The fact that there is nothing that is, there's no entity that's helping and regulating anything right. is my biggest issue with the movement. Because wait till some of these kids get their ta- get tax get 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 the IRS coming after them. Right, right. I know, I know, and that's the stuff that they're not being advised about. Like, there's not an, an entity that's giving them any guidance, which is the my main thing that I hate. But I will tell you this: I I, told, I, I went on the radio last night because somebody asked me about that article and they wanted to bring me on real quick, and I said this. As far as this poaching of players that isn't even in the transfer portal, that is about as wrong of a thing as I have ever seen. And like it is, it is going to get so much worse, man. Like at right. what point is this going to change? Because right. I know they're they're taking it to a government level. The NCAA is still not doing anything. At what point is someone just going to say like, okay, there needs to be regulations here because otherwise, because yeah. you're literally taking it's an FCS program, so like not many people care about it. South Dakota State, even though it's a power on the FCS level, right? One of the better programs on that level. Mm-hmm. They're about to, they could have potentially lost their All American tight end if he didn't absolutely adore that program right. to a to a top feeder. And like you said, it's not going to create parity. There's going to be bottom feeders, and there's going to be right. the elites. That is hundred percent what's going to happen. And how is that right? How is it right that that can happen right now? Yeah, and, and look, like there's an argument to be to be had that some people will make that. You know, it's not fair to the coaches that build these kids up to have them poach. That's not an argument that, I, that I'm going to have much sympathy for because those same coaches will build these kids up and then use the success of those kids to take another job somewhere else for more money. So I, that, that, that argument doesn't really fly for me. Right. So if, if you're going to if you're going to hammer freedom of movement for players, then you need to hammer freedom of movement for coaches as well and make it harder for coaches to just constantly move back and forth for, for more money. Right. I mean. And, and so what, what I mean is like, you know, because like you and I, you know, my stance on freedom of movement. I think you should be able to transfer wherever you want, whenever you want. But you just got to sit out a year. Right. Because it's in and you know, my where my heart is on this, it, because I believe that sit out year is going to make kids really sit down and think that they're making the right decision for the right reasons. You are going to make less emotional decisions. Now, having said that, if that kid from South Dakota State jumped in the portal, I have no problem. School's getting a new bidding war for him because that's that's the rules. As long as it's being done in a way that's at the heart of the name, image, and likeness, which is, hey, you come here, I got these five deals lined up for you. You got to do this commercial thing. You got to do this thing. We're going to use your face on this billboard, whatever the case may be. There's got to be some sort of transaction there. You can't just be offering money to a kid just to come play there. That I don't like. You know, but but these kids can bring great value for different things. I'm I'm good with that. I I've been saying for years that jersey any every like 10, 20% of every jersey sale that you have should always go towards players. It should always go towards a fund to help players when they get out of college because when they're done playing, their injuries don't go away. But the help that you're, you know, the, the support system that they had while they were a player does go away. This would be a way that you could go, hey, we're going to make, you know, however much money we make off football weekend, 10% of it's going towards a, a fund for players. Once you graduate, you can tap into this, assuming, you know, as long as you're not a, you know, there, there should always be something like, hey, you know, Zach Martin doesn't need that, right? Like <laughs> Zach Martin could take care of his own medical bills, right? That You get what I'm saying? Like within reason, there's always that kind of thing. But like, why wasn't this done for years? Because that's looking out for the player. It's because of this other crap that we are now in the this crap storm that we're in now. And, and so you can be for players being able to benefit off of their name, image, and likeness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can absolutely be for that, but against what we're seeing right now. And, and, and that's the thing is there's one simple rule. Hey, if you reach out to a kid and, and this, here's the, this rule is already in place. A th- any, any entity, invo- no one can speak to a player, a family member, a coach, anyone associated with a kid. You can't do back channels. It's against the rules. Well, it wasn't a coach. It doesn't have to be a coach. The rules say anyone, you can't speak to a kid on behalf of another school, whether the school knows it or not. That's already a rule. Enforce it. Hey, Jordan Addison, you can, you're in the portal now. You can go wherever you want, except there and there, because they reached out to you beforehand. Sorry, they're not eligible to get you, but you can go to, you can go to, you know, let's say Alabama and USC reached out to him. That's the rumor that I've heard. Both of those schools were sort of in a negotiation with him before he got in the portal. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. He can transfer wherever the heck he wants, except those schools because they broke the rules. I'm not, and I'm not punishing Jordan Addison for this. I'm not no. punishing him at all. Now people could say, Honest, you know, yeah, they they, they they were the ones that reached a, out. He's to an him, adult like, now. Yeah. He needs to know the rules right. too. But at the same time, it's like I'm not putting this on the shoulders of the players. They need to. They, we need more Zay Flowers. Hundred percent. I have way more respect for Zay Flowers than I do for Jordan Addison. It's fact, fact. But I'm also not going to hold Jordan Addison to the same standard that I'm holding Lincoln Riley and Nick Saban and Steve Sarkeesian and all those people. I'm not. And and that's the difference. Is They better not. So here's what the NCAA is going to do, right? Back to the original question. They're going to declare all these freaking kids ineligible. That's what they're going to do. You think And it's so? going to piss me off. I do. Because they wow. always do stupid things like that. Because they're mm-hmm. always, they're always, they always punish the kids. It's like, let's like you see you'll see a coach get fired in basketball and all the kids that were part of the cheating gets get are gone and the the kids that are there left that didn't do anything wrong the coach the new coach they're the ones that get put on probation like why why are you punishing people that had nothing to do with this it's like notre dame and their their academic thing they suspended all the kids that did that they got their punishment but then you took the wins away from the whole all the players that didn't do anything wrong stupidest thing i've ever heard of and that's what the NCAA does. I, I, I'd i be shocked if they don't if, – if they – like, let's say they pass this rule retroactively or whatever, and they can prove that Jordan Addison did this, that, and the other. I could see them easily giving Lincoln Riley a little slap on the wrist and saying, Jordan Addison, you can't play. That's I'd say that's – that's what. but it, would it shock you if they do that based on what the NCAA no. has a history of doing? No. It, it wouldn't I, mean. I just – I, I hadn't thought about that, to be honest. Yeah. Like that I said, you're not eligible to play there. You can, tra- you can go back right. to Pitt. You can transfer somewhere else. You can't transfer anywhere that that we know you had contact with beforehand, right? Oh man, and, could you imagine all the all the nil money that's been passed out, right? And then you have to kind of figure all that headache out of the yeah. way too. Oh man, yeah. And oh, that's what's, there's an easy fix of this: hammer yeah. the coaches financially, hammer them. And the yeah. first thing, there's two things you do: make the make the the financial penalties for the schools sting a little. Take scholarships away; that stings. Mm-hmm. And then say you can't get a portal. It, it's the international system in baseball, is the one they should adopt for the portal. It, the easiest fix right there. If you get caught cheating the system, you mm-hmm. can't sign a kid from an international system. Like the Reds have done this. Like and there's rules. Like if you spend more than a certain amount, you can't sign anyone the next year. There's like all these types of things. It's similar to that, but I would I would make it very cut and dry. If you get yeah. caught tampering in this situation and I would lower the bar for how to prove it. Like you don't need to have it like beyond a reasonable doubt, like a court of law. This isn't a court of law. You're not being, it's not a felony charge. If there's any kind of, okay, this booster talked to this kid's dad done proved you're done. Right. Mm-hmm. There's no other reason for a guy from LA to talk to Jordan Addison's father or mother or high school coach or whatever the case may be. Right. You're done. You can't, you can't sign a kid. You can't get a transfer for to into your school for three years. You got to make the punishment sting enough. You're like, it's not worth it. It's not worth it right. to do that, right? It's real simple. Wait for the flipping kid to get in the portal, then go after him. It's not that hard. And if a kid wants money that bad, then he can jump on a portal and then he can take that chance, right? Mm-hmm. Because if there's more risk involved for both sides, you're going to see less people jumping in just looking for money, right? And there's some kids that may still do that, but and that's fine. But now you have kids jumping in the portal for the right reasons. My coach isn't giving me a shot. I need to get closer to home. I just don't like it here. All the legitimate reasons kids have to transfer. I transferred after my freshman year, right? And I started as a freshman. I'm pro-transfer as long as it's done in a way where there's enough safeguards in place to make sure kids aren't making emotional decisions that they'll regret down the road. And I use myself as a perfect example because I did. There At D3, there are no – you can do whatever the heck you want. There are no safeguards against it. And so a lot of D3 kids make really immature decisions, emotional decisions. And I don't want to see that come to Division One. And we're already seeing it. And the other thing is you're not helping the kids because go look at the number of kids. I saw it was like it's like 15% at least of the kids that are on scholarship that enter the portal end up without a scholarship. It's because like, it, all the spots are filled. There's like there's I mean, to your point, most of the kids that transfer quickly in a reasonable amount of time have an understanding of where they're transferring to. But also, there's a lot of kids that go into the portal that just aren't advised at all. So I think right. the transfer portal right now is like 5,000, man. There's like 5,000 players in there right now 
who do not know where they're going yet. Like right. they just don't. They and there's are, not enough spots for any, any close to all those kids to have a home. Exactly. Like Notre Dame can't take any of them. They're they're at 85 right now, and because nobody from Notre Dame entered the portal, which shocks some people. And mm-hmm. why? Because all these kids want to play for Marcus Freeman, right? Yeah. So they can't yeah. take anybody right now. They're they're filled. They're full. There's a lot you, of schools you know like that. You know, it's starting to rub me the wrong way too. I liked the initial idea of collectives, right? I, I mm-hmm. really did, but I feel like now they're going to serve as the middleman, so the coaches obviously right. don't get in trouble reaching out to kids. Right. You know, like that's yeah. So right. I don't know. Yeah, you can't. You can't have con. And no one can have any kind of contact, way, shape, or form with a kid from another school. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. And if a kid wants to make more money and he's not happy where he is, do with the kid from Miami. Like I don't like it. It's it's a. But I have no. I have, what the kid, the Miami basketball player did this. He was, I guess, their best player last year. I don't know. Okay. But they, the Miami people, raised all this money to get some Kansas State transfer to go there. So the return, the best player from Miami said, "This is bull crap." So he jumped in the portal saying, hey, I'm, I'm open for business because they're giving this kid all this money. I'm the I, I'm the guy that did all the work last year, and I'm not getting mine. Good, You know what? I, I hate it, but I love it at the same time, right? Because he's doing it the way you're supposed to do it. You jump in the portal and say, hey, I'm open for business. I actually don't have a problem with that. I, I don't. Now, you, you're taking a risk because the school you're coming from, I say, you know what, dude, screw you, right? You know, forget that. And other schools may say, hey, look, we're not willing to give you what that kid gave you, whatever the case may be. There's a risk. There's always, but that's the thing is there's always risk involved in decisions you make, right? There's always professional risks that you that you make when you make a move. You've, you've made a big transition race recently from a career standpoint. There's always risk involved, right? And and when you make that decision, there's it's not like if you hated working at Irish Breakdown a month later, you can call the school, but hey, I was just kidding. You, you know what I mean? Like, I just need to, you know what I mean? Like, hey, you that, that that's done, man. You're, you're Now you're screwed, right? Fortunately, I, I hope you love working at Irish Breakdown, and, and I certainly love having you with us at Irish Breakdown. But but it was still a risk because you, you're a husband, you're a father. There's always risk involved. And at the end of the day, you know, it, it's a broken system. But if a kid wants to jump on the portal and do it the right way and say, hey, I'm open for business, buddy, I got no problem with that. I, I don't, I don't, it makes me like kind of cringe a little bit. But at the end of the day, I'm also okay with it, especially in basketball. So I just, I hate that we're having this conversation. I I really do. I hate that we have to do this, but it it was so obvious that it was going to happen. When you saw the portal and NIL all kind of cut at the same time with like, it was so obvious the NCAA was so afraid to fix anything. I, you know, I just, man, I, I, I hate it. I hate, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it because you can be pro transfer and pro NIL and still look at this and say, yeah, but this ain't it. Right. Like this ain't, this ain't the way to do it. This ain't the way to do it. So let's get to some more questions here, Ryan. Yeah. We haven't, we actually haven't got to a lot of questions today because the ones we've had have been resulted in some very long conversations. So here, here's an interesting one, Ryan, John, a one, who are your top five overrated college football coaches of all time? Wow, that is a really good one. <laughs> I need a list. I need to start writing I, I, down. I mean, just I'm just gonna go off the top of my head. Number one is Les Miles. Ooh, I think he's super one. overrated. People have always considered him like a great coach. He got a title off of Nick Saban's coattails, in my opinion. Uh, I I think he's super overrated. Oh man, mm. this is I'm trying to uh, Dennis Erickson, very overrated coach. Is he rated high? Do people rate him? I mean, yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, here, let's let's here, let's do this. Let's pull up Uh some, you know, just good old internet. Top twenty-five coaches of all time, uh huh, for college football, and see if any lists come up. Uh, someone put someone put my answer in here. It was the first guy I thought about. Kenny Moore said James Franklin, and I agree, Kenny. (laughs) Super overrated, but all time. Like I don't oh, know if, he, if he's held time. up. Like no. if we're gonna go co- a current college football, he's at the yeah. very. He's in my top three. Yes, he's, he's in my top right three. Now. Yeah. Let's see here. So, uh, Bo Schembechler, twenty three. I know a lot of people that think Bo Schembechler was overrated as a coach. I don't agree with that. I, I don't think. I think that if you were to like this list right here ranks him twenty third. If you were to rank him fifth, because that's overrated. Guy never won a title, mm-hmm. but. There's something to be said for being really good over a long period of time. It's like the it's like um, uh, Hall of Fame. There's the mm-hmm. debate of okay, how do you evaluate a guy like Terrell Davis and Gail Sayers 
versus a guy who rushed for a lot of yards over 15 years. Baseball is probably a better example because football, yeah. they don't have the longevity. But you have some of these guys that were like one 300 games, but they played for like 25 years. You don't have to win mm -hmm. a lot of games per year if you pay for 25 years. You know what I mean? It's like getting 3,000 hits. Your career 270 hitter. But you just played for 20 plus years, you know. Uh, there's the longevity. So to me, I, I you've got to either be a super super star for a period of time, or you have to be really good for a long period of time because that's actually really hard to do. So mm -hmm. that's where I kind of come down on Bo. I know a lot of people that view that that think Bo is overrated. I just I can't go there for me personally. Mm -hmm. Here's one that I wanted to ask you. <laughs> This may be before your time. I get the people in the chat's okay. question. I know a lot of people who think Bobby Bowden was overrated. I don't think that's the case. He's ranked 15th on this so. list. He's got no, two titles, so. yeah. and he was good for a long time, and he took over a program that sucked. Yeah. I think that's the other I, thing, too. I, I consider him one of the best coaches of all time. I don't think yeah. he's overrated. Oh, man. Marcus just took mine in the chat, Brian. He just took who who was it? Was Brian it Joe Keller. Paterno? Brian, Brian Kelly. Kelly, yeah, super overrated, <laughs> super overrated. The all time leading his coach in Notre Dame history. What are you talking yeah. about, man? He, here's one for me. Here's one for me. Bear Bryant. Now, let, let me explain where I'm coming from on this. I think Bear Bryant yeah. is a great coach. I think sure. he's one of the ten to fifteen best coaches ever. Where I I, I kind of feel like he had, but he's been put on this like this mythical type of level that I don't necessarily buy. And I mean, look, five titles and all that kind of stuff. But some of the titles they have are like, yeah, you, you I don't know if you should claim that one. The SEC wasn't super great at some of those times. But like I just saw the list. He's ranked number two. And Nick Saban's number one. And you have Bear, Bear Bryant ahead of Newt Rockney and Frank Leahy. And it's like, eh, I don't know if I can go there. I don't know if I can go there. Here's another one for me. Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno feasted on crap schedules his entire career. And so they get to these bowl games against good teams. It's like, it's like the only good team you played all year. I always thought Joe Paterno was super overrated. Hmm. So those are those are my all-time guys. This list did not have Dennis Erickson. This list didn't have Jimmy Johnson in it either, which I kind of understand. He didn't coach in college football for a long time. I think Steve yeah. Spurrier is a little bit underrated on this one. But there's a lot of guys on this list that I've never even heard of these guys. And some are like they're, they're super old, like – you know, fielding Yost. I don't freaking know anything about fielding Yost other than <laughs> he was a flaming anti or anti uh, Catholic guy. Let's see, yeah, because this one here has Bear Bryant number one, mm -hmm. and then you know it's like Newt Rock. Newt Rock. The thing that hurts Newt Rock is just the longevity because he because he passed away. He died in the accident, so he didn't get to be as long. But what he did was insane. Tom Osborne number four. That's too high for me. That's is way it? too high. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't win a title for like 20 years or something. I mean, something insane like that. Like, he coached a long time. He had some really good teams, but like top five coach of all time. Uh, uh I can't, I can't go there. I can't go there on that one. I can't go there on that one. Let's see here. He won two and a half national titles. I guess is a better way of saying it because he split one with Michigan. I'm, I'm combing through that list that you have up to now. Yeah, um, Joe Paterno seven. I just can't go. I can't go there with that. Like, see, that's the thing. Is like, I can admit that Joe Paterno is a really successful coach, but like top ten to fifteen, I just I can't I can't go there. You have Woody Hayes ahead of Frank Leahy. That's absurd. Let's see here. Barry Switzer at thirteen. That's too high. Yeah, I agree on that one. Yeah. Let's see here. Oh. So see, we we should change this to top five. Most overrated coaches in college football yeah. now. That would be a little more. Yeah, fun. that'd be a little easier. Yep, I'd be a little easier. Yeah, some some of these some of these guys. It's like this one had this one had uh, Larry Karras the twenty eighth. If you're going to include D three guys in here, how can you not have Larry Karras higher? Like, do you know who Larry Karras is? Is it Ryan? Mountain Union? Mountain He's a Mountain Union. Union. Yeah. So if you, like, first of all, I don't think you should compare. D three coaches to D one coaches because it's such a different animal. I mean, I, with all due respect, I coach that level. Larry yeah. Karras from nineteen ninety three to two thousand twelve won one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven national championships from nineteen ninety three to two thousand twelve, and good. he was also semi quarter. So he 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 went to the semifinals the first time in two ninety two, won his first title in ninety three, quarterfinal semifinal 
championship, 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 semifinal, championship, 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 semifinal, or championship loss, semifinal, championship, championship, championship loss, championship, three straight years where he lost the championship, and then another championship. His worst season from 1992 to 2012, his worst season was 12 was 10 and 2 in 94. After that, he had a couple 12 and 1 seasons. Like if you're going to include him, then you have to make him a top 5 to 10 coach. I mean, you have to, which is why he shouldn't be included. Name me another coach that has 11 national championships and basically like a 20 25 year span and has 1 2 3 4 5 6 5 number 2 finishes. Right. So if and they had like John Gallardi over him, the guy from St. John's who won like he was a great coach. But he again, he coached forever. That's why he's in he's in that that list. So they have John Gallardi head of of Larry Karras because he coached from 1949 to 2012. And he has the all time, you know, like he's like super high coach. He won one, two, three, two, two national, two national championships. He was a St. John's from 19, let's see, 53 to 2012. He won two NAIA championships at St. John's. And then when they joined Division Three in the 70s, they won two national championships from the 70s to 2012. And you're going to have him ranked ahead of Larry Karras. What was Larry Karras' all-time record? Very curious on that. It was 332, 24, and 3. <laughs> that's insane which is why he shouldn't be in the conversation with other division one coaches that's it's a different level but if you're going to yeah. include him he's got to be higher than 28th like yeah. that's a little nutty that's a, it's very that's very nutty it's yeah a little nutty yeah <laughs> it's very nutty <laughs> yeah yeah Dabo Sweeney 31st Dabo's been good for like five years mm-hmm. like I'm sorry Dabo Dabo's not you got da- no, mm-mm, sorry. You have Dabo ahead of Jim Trestle. You know who I thought was a little overrated? Just a little bit. Because mm-hmm. I, I really did like Bob Stoops, but I thought he was a little overrated. Just Yeah, just a, they have just a him. Hair. They have him 29th on this list. Here's yeah. who they have him ahead of. They had him have him ahead of John Robinson, have him ahead of Jim Trestle. How do you have Bob Stoops ahead of Jim Trestle? If you're going to include what guys did at lower levels, which they are if they have Larry Karras, how do you not have Jim Trestle in there? He's got like three national championships at Ohio State and the one double. Bob Stoops has one national title. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that one. They have they have Bob Stoops over Pete Carroll. Didn't that, didn't that USC beat Oklahoma by like 50 in a title game one year? With Jason White, right? They smashed yeah. him, didn't they? Yeah. Destroyed him. Yeah. Yep. That one doesn't – yeah, yeah, Bob Stoops ahead of – Daryl Royal. I'm not <laughs> sure if I can go with you there. I'm definitely not sure. Yeah, they in this list. When did this list come out? This list came out in 2019. They had Frank Beamer ahead of Urban Meyer. Now, Frank Beamer's ahead of Urban Meyer in the, the human decency list for sure. <laughs> but how do you have him over Urban Meyer as a as a coach? Urban Meyer won what? three national titles frank beamer won zero now frank was a great coach hall of famer but come on yeah yeah you, you, you know jimmy johnson 40 yeah jimmy johnson one spot ahead of lloyd carr hmm. how's lloyd carr that high right <laughs> that's what sorry. i was thinking too <laughs> i'm sorry bill snyder 55th too low in my opinion uh bill snyder's a great coach yeah great coach. definitely too low in my opinion yeah he should be higher on that list this is an interesting list. I'm going to have to study this one of these days. This is very, very interesting. Who is who is the coach that was at Nevada for a long time? And like Chris, quietly, Chris Alt. Chris Alt. He was a really yeah. good coach for a long time. Just didn't get any credit at all. And he revolutionized certain things. And I respect that. The, pi- the pistol, right? He, he right. was a big pistol guy. Right. Yep. He kind of made that a thing. You have, you have Brian Kelly, 89th, ahead of Barry Alvarez. Okay. Ahead, ahead of Barry Brian Alvarez. Kelly, ahead of Hayden Fry. Wait, where did they have Barry Alvarez? On they had place? Brian Kelly ahead of Howard Schnellenberger, who, you know, won titles. You know, come on. Give me a break. It sounds really like they had close. Alvarez pretty low, too. I like They had Alvarez. John Cooper ahead of Chris Alt. They had Chris Alt um, 99th. Chris Alt was a really good coach. Yes, he was. Really coach. Hilarious. Anyway, let's get back on track. That's some good <laughs> stuff. We should, we, should do, we should do a show on that. I'm actually going to write that down. Best coaches... And we're going to do a show this summer on the best who we we're going to rank our 10 to 15 best coaches in college football. We're going to rank them. 
And then we're also going to do most overrated coaches. I, I want to pull this comment up real quick because yeah. from Ben G. 1801 says, oh, is God. this big game boomers list? Have you seen that? They guy come out Twitter? with the worst lists. Oh, it's like the, the, at I first put... I thought they tried. Now yeah. I feel like they do things just to create. Like that's what happens in the social media world, Ryan, is mm-hmm. people do things and then they start getting attention and then they start doing things for attention. Right. And some of the lists they've come up with recently are just some of the just the dumbest things you could it's, possibly it's, see. It's, cl- it's clickbait, man. But it's not yeah. even monetized clickbait. It's just right. clickbait. So- well, so- sometimes people, the, it's the attention that feeds them. It's the gotcha. likes. They're, 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 like there are people literally like they just they do nothing but focus on did I get likes? Look, well, how many likes I get? How many followers I have? They're obsessed with it. It's that's silly. weird. That's silly. It's I mean, very, I I, very I, weird. I appreciate the followers, but like you know, yeah. I'm 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 trying to make a living. Sure. You know, sure, so. <laughs> exactly. Oh boy, good question, John Blaine Tiller. Which quarterback will fare best against Notre Dame? C.J. Stroud, C. Caleb Williams. Williams. Caleb Williams. Uh, Phil Jerkovic, Caleb Williams, Phil Jerkovic, and DJ Uyunglele. I think I said that somewhere right. Considering the offense they will have around them and the Notre Dame defense this year under Golden. I'm going to say something else. There's a couple quarterbacks that, that Notre Dame fans need to know that they're mm-hmm. not talking about on this list. And there's a guy, Ryan, I want to get your opinion on, as we, and yeah. I'll answer the question. Have you seen Grant Wells? He transferred from Virginia Marshall. Tech. Transfer to Virginia yeah. Tech, though. Did he yeah. transfer to Virginia Tech? Freaking yeah. sucks. He's a, he's in a quarterback battle with Jason Brown, who started a couple games for South Carolina last that year. That freaking so sucks. There. I yeah. hate that crap. He is a pretty talented player, though, so I'm glad you asked yeah. about him. It helps yeah. Notre Dame, but yes, I hate that. I freaking yeah. hate that. I'm so sick of this crap. Anyway, um, there are some good quarterbacks on the list this year. And nobody said he didn't say Tanner McKee. Hey, I've been reading on mock drafts that Tanner McKee is going to be a top 10 NFL draft pick next year, Blaine. So I don't know why you're sleeping on Tanner McKee here, buddy. I say with utter sarcasm oozing out of my pores. I like Tanner McKee, but come on, man. Like uh, kids talented, I, kids talented. I, but yeah, I agree. Seriously. I watched yep. a Kentucky game last night. Cause it's like, man, I got to watch Will Levis again because what the heck am I missing? And I'm like, yeah, I was right. Like, no, he's not. No, I'm sorry. Uh, he's not that. Which guy is going to fare the best against Notre Dame? I know who I hope fares the best, and I hope I know who I hope fares the least. I mean, to me, I I hope that C.J. Stroud and D.J. have the worst games because I think <laughs> they have the best supporting casts. Yeah, and so if they and, play really well, it's going to be. And you want you want Phil Dracovic to have the best game? There's no they question. Still lose. There's no question. <laughs> I want him to. I yep. want I wanted. You know what I would love? This is going to sound crazy. Here's my dream scenario for how this season plays out for Notre Dame. They go 10 and 0 to start the season. Great team, number one in the country. And we all think we're going to get a repeat of BC 93. Phil leads BC down the field. They kick a field goal with a minute left, and we're thinking, oh, here we go. Phil's going to pay back. Phil has a big game. Zay Flowers has a big game. It's payback. Notre Dame was overlooking BC, thinking USC, all this other kind of stuff. And here we go again. And then Tyler Buckner comes in, leads him back on a game winning drive to win the game. That to me would be a great scenario because I have a great deal of respect for Phil, his family. I'm hugely rooting for Zay Flowers now after what happened. I would love to see Phil have a big game there, but I still want to see Notre Dame win. And I feel like that would also give Notre Dame fans that redemption. It's like it would slay that 93 dragon of the BC game, you know, uh, where you give it back to them. And mm-hmm. then, of course, the next week you go out and curb stomp USC to go 12 and 0. And- and then I'm one seed in the college football playoff. That 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 would be that would be a dream scenario for me. So yeah. how, what what is, what are your thoughts on this one, Ryan? I, I mean, I think I feel the same. I was going to say, like, I I obviously like Phil Dracovic as you know, just a young man and a player as well. I mean, he should be a guy that I think is talked about a little more in those early NFL mock drafts, to be honest. But yeah, I, mm-hmm. I like Phil, and he's on the worst team that was listed there. Most well, mm-hmm. USC or Boston College. Let's have a debate there someday, but least talented of the player of the teams listed there so i don't think that hurts you tremendously if he has a great game i mean you obviously have to play well but i'd say the guys that worry me the most are with the team involved would be shroud dj then caleb then phil 
Not that not that DJ is better you than know. Caleb because he's not. It's more it's just like you, the team you, around him. Caleb could lead USC to thirty eight points and their name still wins by ten. Exactly. Like with Clemson's defense, DJ doesn't have to lead them to forty points to win. You know, I mean, because this defense is going to be better again unless they have three of their best players out like they did in twenty twenty, right? Mm-hmm. Which you know, but yeah, I, I to your point, I think DJ playing better, he's going to have a better system. I mean, Caleb could put up big numbers and they could still lose. He did that several times in the Big Twelve last year. And they're gonna, you know, Notre Dame's obviously a better team than that. Here's here's a good question, Ryan, from John A. One: Is modern football left the middle linebacker position undervalued? Seems like more emphasis is going to hybrid outside linebackers to pri- as to prime to as to primarily second level players. I need. I think we need to specify this, Ryan. I think we need to specify college and NFL. Yeah, because I, I think the games are different enough to where I I don't think it's undervalued in the NFL. I do think yeah. it's undervalued in college football. I, th- I think the for the NFL, I think the just the prototype of what a middle linebacker looks like is changing a little bit, but mm-hmm. I don't think it's less valuable at all. I mean, it's because it, especially when you're running, cause you're going to be running a lot more lighter boxes now, right? Because every mm-hmm. team's in sub package now. So you might only have two linebackers on the field the majority of the time. So having a guy that can handle the run, I think that's where people really miss on him. I, I, I historically do very well at linebacker evaluations. I really do because I think a lot of people undervalue they just love these great athletes on the second level, which I'm like, yeah, I, I, I value great athletes on the second level as well. But I also value eyes, discipline mm-hmm. as a run filler, being able to stop the run because they are a run first player still, even in the modern game, they're still a run first player. So that's why I think people missed on a Nick Bolton last year. He came out of Missouri because he's a little shorter and he wasn't the greatest athlete, but it's like, but guys, are, are you watching the film? Nobody can but look who they hyped them. up. They hyped exactly. up the kid from Kentucky who had production, but like just we saw it this year too. It. Yeah, we saw it this year too. It. Quay Walker's the first linebacker off the board. Leo Chanel doesn't go to pick hundred. Leo Chanel is going to be a better football player in the NFL, I believe, than Quay yeah. Walker, just flat out. So, yep, good question there. I think that in college football, teams are not putting enough value on middle linebackers like Junior Two Alamaka. The reason I say that is, is it's kind of like what you said, Ryan, but I think it's being undervalued in, in college football because there's this notion of, well, you know, you got to get speed on the field. And I understand all that, but a middle linebacker still needs to be a run defender. And the the, the more that teams are going to this speed, you're going to see more and more teams start running at you more and more and more and more and more. Because if you're going to try to put a 220 pound, and we saw this with Notre Dame, you try to put a 220 pound linebacker that can run, but not a real strong kid, you're, you're, you're going to, some of those teams are just going to be able to run on you up the middle. And that's just the reality. I think being able to, to be able to have a thumper at middle linebacker, like a junior to Alamaka. And I've talked about this in the past, Ryan, before I hired you, we talked about this during recruiting last year. If you have the potential to have a five man box with a kid like junior to Alamaka and, and you have safeties that can, you know, can come down, but you can do a lot defensively. If you have that kind of middle linebacker. Now, again, he's got to be able to run. You can't, he can't be a, just a tackle to tackle guy. But if you can have a kid that can be a force up the middle and you can constantly insert five guys into those gaps, you're going to have a chance to be a pretty good run defense if, if you have some other pieces in place. You replace that guy with a 225-pound really fast kid that's not real physical, you're going to be fine against some teams, but you're going to get thumped by Alabama. You're going to get thumped by Notre Dame. You're going to get thumped by Ohio State. You're going to get thumped by those teams that know how to run the football and, and have talent. So I, I think that that's why one of the reasons I loved Junior Tua Maka because you can do a lot with him in this defense that then frees you up to do some other things with a Marist, with a you know Jalen Sneed, with some of these other athletic guys because you have that big thick kid that can move right there in the middle of your defense. I, I think there's value to that in my opinion, and not enough you, people you, are doing that. You know what else I think Alabama's defenses haven't been great over the last couple of years. You know what I really think it is is the fact that you're having underdeveloped linebackers like Dylan Moses and Christian Harris over the last couple of years. Like yep. Those guys haven't developed, and they haven't been big-time players from the middle linebacker position, which I think has hurt them tremendously. Well, and I think part of the reason they haven't developed, Ryan, is because they're athletes, not necessarily football players, right? Like if Christian Harris had the instincts of the kid that they have that they got from Hawaii or from De La Salle, he'd, he'd be a first-round draft pick. He'd be a top-15 draft pick, right, in my yeah. opinion. Right. Cause mm-hmm. that kid's got, I mean, that kid just isn't the athlete. Like if he had, if he had Manti Teo's instincts and feel for the game, he'd be, a, he'd be a really great player. 
And it's it's kind of like they're all trying to find a, the next Jalen Smith from what he was in college, right? But Jalen had instincts. Jalen had Jalen knew how to play the game before his knee injury. And and so I think you're right. Alabama has gone away from what worked, and you know they've got these really athletic guys that are wrong fitting, and you know you can manipulate with RPOs, you can manipulate with move. Because here's the thing: guys like that, you can manipulate big time. Hey man, this kid. As soon as this kid sees a pulling guard, he's he's gone. He's taken off. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna pull the kids that, that way and run buck sweep or run sweep away or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, and you better hope your safeties are. I think that's the second part. Alabama has not been as good the last couple of years overall as they were in the past at linebacker, inside linebacker, and safety because they don't have the erasers at safety to make up for the mistakes at linebacker. I think yeah. it's a double-edged sword. I and mean, they've had they've had good safeties, but not the kind of elite guys they had in the past that if you did make a mistake at linebacker, they were there to clean it up. And right. that's that's where I think they've fallen off, in my opinion. And mm-hmm. you know, because it's again, it's getting back. Hey, we gotta be we gotta be able to run. That's fine. You can run, but if I can just run it right up down your throat, I mean that's what Georgia did to them in the second half of the title game. They just just kept they just and they weren't able to run on them a super great early. But they just kept at it. They kept at it. They kept at it. And they wore Alabama down. And yeah. linebackers make a couple mistakes, and bam, there you go. And, this, uh, this, despite what pro football focus tells you, you still build teams inside out. That's all. I'll oh just put God. it there. Yes, yeah, so bad. So 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 bad. Oh goodness gracious. Uh, let's get back here. Uh, Jordan Schreiber, can you rank the receivers on the board with these new offers out? It's it's too early for that. I haven't I, I for me I haven't dove into Joshua Manning the way that I have other guys. I've watched him. I like him, but in mm-hmm. regards to comparing him to other guys, I'm not prepared to do that just yet. So my receiver board has not changed. Now I just have a a guy at the bottom with an asterisk that I got to then go grade <laughs> and plug. But you know he brings some intriguing skills. Ryan, we're talking about obviously Joshua Manning from uh, Lee Summit, Missouri, who was yep. Recently offered by Notre Dame. This is the typical we're back on the road and we discovered a kid type of prospect. Because he said to you in the interview, like, I just started talking to Notre Dame just now. Like, talk, <laughs> said, hi, here's an offer. <laughs> Let's go. So very, very infancy. But he, he tell you what, he's he can run, right? He can run. There's no uh, doubt about nah, that. No, nah, he can run. I mean, Manning's a long and he's listed at around six foot three, 190 pounds, and he is an absolute burner. And I think that he both has a long stride length, but I also think he just has generally really good foot quickness. Uh, yeah, he, he can absolutely run. And then Cam Williams is a guy, is the other receiver that just was added to the board pretty recently. He's been a guy that's actually been to Notre Dame before. He's kind of a similar mold, though. He's a little bit longer. He's not quite as big as as Manning is. I think he's listed like 6'2", 175, somewhere in that ballpark. He's a little lanky right now, but he averaged nearly 20 yards a catch last year. So I think the things that you're seeing, the – consistency with Manning and the Williams offers recently is length foot speed. Like both those guys are kind of, they got a little burner to them. So very interesting players, both of them. John a one, who would be bet the better boundary receiver in 2022 with the coaching staff between chase with the current coaching staff between chase Claypool, miles Boykin, most Stovall, all Demi St. Brown and Corey Robinson. I know who my pick would be on that. It's easy. Yeah, I, I mean, so, I mean, if you're just assuming the coaching is going to be a, a, a good right. commodity, I'm going mm-hmm. to pick who I I think Chase Claypool is the most physically gifted player there. So that's why I was most take. physically gifted. He's number two on my list. Oh, okay. Most of all. Oh, you love Maurice Stovall. Stovall. I do. I, I, I like Maurice Stovall. Here, here's the, he was an elite blocker. He could do things after the catch. He had tremendous length. He actually was a better contested guy than Chase was in college. He was a oh, better sure. winning contested throws. And I think that is that is one of the top three needs for a guy in, at boundary. I actually really like Chase as a field guy because I think he can do things after the catch. I think he can, you know, he's he's a guy that can do different things. He can work in space. He wouldn't be my number one. He wouldn't be in my start. I mean, if we're going to go back to, let's just say from most of all on. So let's say from 05 on, and I could make up my, my ideal starting receiving core I, I mean, it, it, the guy that I think the ideal W is not on this list, and it's Michael Floyd. I mean, that's that's my ideal W. There, there's not a better guy on this list, in my opinion, than Michael Floyd. I just there's just not it's fair. No, there's not. Uh, there's not right. It's not. And, and so you know, I'd I'd put Mo next. 
but the thing about Chase is you don't have like my, with those out you there's Corey Robinson can't play anywhere else in my opinion or at least not as well. EQ maybe could play some X. I think he could play some X. Chase could play Z or X. He I mean he could play all over. But Michael Floyd's my boundary, and Will Full and Will Fuller's my X. I mean those are no brainers. We we can get into some other conversation. I mean think about this receiving core. You got Will Fuller as your X, my, Michael Floyd as your W, and Golden Tate as your Z. Have fun trying to stop that. With Michael oh, Mayer, yeah. Gold, pick Gold a tight Tate. end. Michael Mayer, Kyle Rudolph, Tyler Eifert. It doesn't matter. Pick a tight end. It doesn't matter. Golden Tate would be the easy one in the slot. Like that, oh my I don't have to think about that one. <laughs> like yes, Just kidding yes, me. Agree. <laughs> so agree. I'd, be, I'd be a sick receiving core, an absolutely sick receiving core. But yeah, Ty, of Tyler those Eifert options, tight most of all, yeah, of those options, yeah. most of all is my guy. If I can include everybody else from that era, there's no doubt that Michael Floyd is my guy. I mean, it's not even a debate for me. But of that group, yeah, and I do love most of all. I, I I so enjoyed watching him play, and I would have loved to seen what he could have done with four years of good coaching. Yeah, you know, yeah he had been fun. He had he had a crazy catch radius, man. He had good oh, hands gosh. too. I feel yeah. like nothing came out of his hands. Yeah. There was one time he made this sick catch against BYU. I think it was a touchdown. And if you actually go back and look, it looked like he jumped way off the ground. But if you go, he didn't actually get off the ground that high. I'm like, man, he didn't really didn't jump that high. He just had such insane reach. He just wasn't yeah. very fast because the yeah. strength program hurt. Maybe I shouldn't say good coaching because I actually think the guy before Charlie, I think it was Trent West, might have been the receiver. He did a decent job with technique. The problem is the strength coach, the strength program sucked back then. Guys just got real stiff. It happened to Julius Jones. He got stiff. Uh, my, my, most of all got stiff. A lot of those guys put on bad weight and got stiff, and uh, Mo was definitely one of those guys. Ben, Benjamin Carchi had a uh, one, part one, is had a thought. What do you think about having a trade deadline for the transfer portal? Players can enter the portal whenever they want, but coaches and schools can only reach out uh, during open time. Your thoughts? I, I, my initial reaction is I have I do not like the whole can enter whenever they want. I think the window should be open at certain times because I don't want kids jumping in the portal in the middle of the season. I think that's like I, I think that's terrible for kids. I think because at the end of the day, what's our number one priority here, Ryan? It should be about developing young people, helping kids. Yeah, that's what yeah. it should be about: developing young men. And young men in football, and it should be, you know, whatever in every other sport. It's about developing young people to be successful in life. And what are we teaching them? Anytime your boss treats you bad, you can just jump in a portal and be emotional. That's why I like the sit-out rule. You, you don't have as much of that. You're forcing kids, hey, go deal with your problems. There's too much of that in our society where it's just like, ah, oh, you know, like, ah, oh, just quit. Oh, you can't, you, you're eventually going to run out of jobs to quit. Okay, you're, I'm sorry. And I think this is a terrible precedent. And I just, I don't, I don't like the idea of the portal being open at any time. I think it should open. I think it should open up a week after the conference championship games, maybe just the regular season, but I, I would open it after the conference championship games and give kids that window between the end of the regular season or the championship games. And then the start of the fall semester, give them a window during that period of time. And then the portal shut. Then it opens again on May 1st. Or, you know, you know, at the end of the school year, and then it's open, you know, you, kids have the summer to figure out where they want to go. It should be open during that period of time only. Because, again, you need to be smart about it. But I don't want kids jumping in a portal in the middle of October because you're pissed that your coach wasn't nice to you. You can't mm -hmm. go anywhere anyway. So what do you need to be in there for? Focus on school. Get your classes right. Keep pushing. You can learn through that. Adver you, you can become a better man through that adversity of, of having to go to work every day with a coach you don't like. As long as the coach isn't like physically abusing you or putting you in a situation where he's trying to get you hurt, then you just walk, quit, right? And then go go talk to somebody and get that guy freaking fired, right? But kids don't need to be jumping into portal in the middle of the season. We, we need to get away from that nonsense. Open it up at the end of the season and then open it up again at the end of the spring. So that way kids can – they don't have that crutch of, oh, I'm just going to go jump in a portal if you're if you're you know, mean to me or you don't give me the reps I want. We're not, right. we're not teaching young people good things when we're doing crap like that. So I understand where the you're worst. coming from, Benjamin, but I just don't – I don't like that idea for me. Did you, what do you, did what you see you? – did you see before the FCS playoffs last year, the quarterback from Montana State who was the starter all year entered the portal like right before the playoffs – it's just I, I there has to be some type of I don't want to call it a restriction, but there has to be some type of figuring out of as far as like what the timelines are and such, because that just, yeah. it I mean, it just kills teams. Right. Like, and right. again, I don't want I don't want to stop a player from being able to to enter the portal. But 
I mean, if you're entering a, a, during the season, what 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 what's the bonus there? Right. Like, what what are you getting out of it? Right. What do we and what what example are we setting for these young people that hey, you know what? As long here's the thing, as long as it's good for you, it doesn't matter how many people you screw over. That's a horrible life lesson, but that's exactly what the portal has become, Ryan. It doesn't matter what you're doing to other kids. People say, well, it's good for players. Well, it's good for that player. What about the kid who just worked his butt off for the last three years trying to earn that spot, and now they were able to just go out and buy a player from the portal, right? What about the kids who are depending on that guy to be there for the, the next game kind of thing? Like, offseason is different. I've said this. Once the offseason comes, it's it's you time. It's focused on you time, right? It's Whether it's NFL draft, whether it's the portal, there's got to be a window where you can figure out what's best for you in your life. And that's that's okay because all of us have to make individual decisions at some point in time. But there's a right way and a wrong way. And like you said, a kid freaking jumping into the portal right before the, the play. Did he leave the team or did he at least stay with the team? I think he left the team. That's sure. just, just like, and, and I wouldn't want that guy. If I'm another team, I wouldn't want that guy. But you know what? There's going to be some scumbag coach out there who doesn't care about that. I wonder. You know, I, wonder and, if they, I wonder if that kid yeah. ever landed anywhere. I so I, I'd, I'd want no part of that. No part of that. But yeah, I think there should be smaller windows for the portal. In my opinion, I absolutely. I don't think kids they shouldn't be focusing on that stuff. That kid, that kid John A. One asked about underrated kid. college football coaches. We're going to talk about. I, I'm. Gonna, let's talk about that during our. our that's going to be something we're going to do soon. I think that'll be a lot of fun, Ryan. But I think that's a John. That's a question that that's such a good question that it needs to have its own show so we can do some prep work for it because that's a really deep question. Because I'm going to name some guys that I'll probably regret saying later or I'll forget about some guys. So that's a great. Those are great questions, John. And we're going to use those as uh, topic starters for future shows. So uh, when we do those shows, we will lie and say that it was our idea and we came up with it because we're wicked smart and we'll give you no credit, John, but we're going to have those shows coming up here soon. Uh, no question. Golden Cab ND. This is going to be one. Here's a good one. Do you see Foskey and Justin Adamiola being on the field more together this season during an obvious third down passing situation? Yes, definitely. They were actually on the field a lot together last year on third down, like almost always on third down last year. We're going to see them a ton. I think, what we're going to see less of this year is last year it seemed like there was a lot of snaps, Ryan, where one of them was dropping and one of them was rushing. I think we're going to see more of them both rushing this year. I think we're going to see more four-man pressures this year than we saw last year in those third-down situations. Yeah, I think I think it's a, lo a little bit of a disservice if you don't get them on the field on the obvious mm -hmm. passing situations, right? Like that's to your most – well, your – your most a a talented pass rusher, and then your most refined pass rusher. You need to get both those guys on the field. Mm -hmm. John A1 asks, how would Brady Quinn fare in today's Notre Dame offense? <sighs> I, I think he'd be pretty good. I don't know if he would be uh, – this is going to sound weird because he's my favorite quarterback. Him and Tony Rice are my two favorite quarterbacks, but – I don't know if he would fare quite as well in this offense. And here's why I say that Brady had a bit of a long release and he wasn't like super, super great at getting the ball out real fast. He could, you know, but not real fast. And Brady wasn't the most accurate guy. Like his, his accuracy gets, gets criticized too much in some circles, in my opinion, like they make it seem like he was, you know, like just couldn't hit the broadside of bar, which is insane. He completed over 60% of his passes two years in a row, and completing 60% of your passes was not an easy thing to do. But I, I don't I don't know if he would have been quite as good now as he was then. But then my counter to that is, but there'd be a lot more easier throws that he'd be able to make. So that'd be a counter to it. Uh, so, I, you know, John, my initial gut reaction is, I think he was playing in the perfect offense for him under Charlie. I do. I, you know, I, and I don't know if this offense would be as great for him, but you know, that's, I could be wrong. More, what, what's your, what's your thoughts on that, Ryan? Well, no, I mean, he was a, uh, so when you say that you, you mean that like the uh, more of a vertical base system, push yeah. the ball down. And I'm the talking field, statistically, I'm talking right. statistically, like he threw right. for 3,900 yards and 39 touchdowns one year or 37 touchdowns one year. I mean, it was, it was, he, he put up monster numbers. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, yeah, that's more I'm referring to. And yeah, I think he was a guy that was back shoulder fake. I mean, think about how many 
Brady Quinn, I would be curious to kind of go through the 05 season and say how many of his throws were either look screens or back shoulder throws, like fades. It's a lot. Yeah. It was, it was a lot. lot. And that's just not something they do a lot in this offense. Now, maybe that's because they don't have Mo Stovall and Jeff Samarsha. <laughs> but even when they had Boykin and Claypool, they didn't do that stuff a ton. They should have done it more, in my opinion. They didn't oh, do yeah. that stuff a ton. I would I would have thrown look screens out, out to Claypool mm-hmm. all day, man, until and they stopped back it. shoulders all day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they did that against Stanford and Stanford in, in 18, and Stanford couldn't stop it. I mean, they just had no answers for Miles Boykin in that game. John A1 asks, do you think Notre Dame could be effect, an effective 22 personnel package and go tempo? I'll let you take that one there, Ryan. So 20, 22. It's two backs, two tight ends. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, sure, but I, I mean, I don't think it's the best option to go, John, if you're if you're really trying to harp tempo. Like, it just – because you're condensing everything a little bit too much for my liking, right? Like, I think that you can be creative with the running back usage in, in a two-back set, obviously. But I, I just I, – I, off the top of my head, like, i just not a big fan of that thought process, personally. I think it's something they could do as a change-up, like in a game. You know, just kind of come out and, you know, go too tight and, you know, put Mayer out wide and – put your other receiver out wide and put Chris Tyree or Jadarian Price in the slot as just something to could keep, you know, maybe you run a couple jet suites off of that just to try to catch them. You know, I think I, I always look for stuff like that, John, in, in a, in a wrinkle that we're hoping that they don't catch on to it. And on the third, we're setting the first two plays are setting up for the shot. We're going to take on the third play. I think it'd be something like that, but as like a, as a staple, as in like a, a, this is a personnel grouping we use on a week to week basis. I think it has some limitations. Once teams get some film on it, it would have some limitations, in my opinion. And and so, uh, wrinkle, yes. Overall, no. Here's an interesting question that I'm not sure I'm going to feel com- super comfortable answering. John A1 asks, would you rather have Phil Jerkovic or Tyler Buckner going into 2022? I mean, from a – so it's it's not in a vacuum, right? Because Phil right. Jerkovic is who they is are a- now. Right. Yeah, is a fifth year senior and Tyler Buckner is going to be a sophomore. So I guess in that in this world that John is making for us, I guess I would go with Phil Dracovic just because he's played a lot of football at this point, right? Like he's kind of been there mm-hmm. and done that to a high degree. So I, I guess I would defer to that, but I'm comfortable with Tyler. Like I'm just comfortable with having Tyler. But I guess I would go with Phil just just for the experience factor, honestly. I don't think there's not a gap there's not really a gap in talent they're different players but they're both Mm -hmm. extremely talented in their own mold so i don't think if there's a talent discrepancy that might push it towards tyler but the fact that phil is also very talented and has experience that would be where i would probably go there i had tyler height ranked higher as a junior phil was ranked higher after senior year phil was phenomenal senior and tyler didn't get a play as a senior if this was a scenario in which phil never left it'd be Phil easily. If it's a scenario where Phil comes back for his fifth year at Notre Dame, no. And that's coming from someone who loves Phil Dracovic. But look, he left. I love Phil. I wish he wouldn't have left. I think he's going to be a great player for BC this year. And and that's a great – I mean, I, this is not a shot at Phil. It's just that – but he left. Were the circumstances unfortunate? Were they his fault? No. And I, and I got – Phil was not to blame for him leaving. But again, he left. And Tyler's here. And that's how I always feel like, give me the kid that's at Notre Dame. And, and I always, would you trade this Notre Dame player for that guy? No, because that Notre Dame player wanted to be here. That guy didn't, right? But if Phil never left, and you were going to ask me who I'd want to start a cornerback, it's Phil. It's a no-brainer. He's a fifth-year senior who's incredibly talented. Tyler Buckner's a redshirt, a sophomore who's incredibly talented. Right. So give me the fifth year, incredibly talented guy over the sophomore, incredibly talented guy. That would be my answer. But honestly, if Phil never would have left and they would, I'll say this. I put this on the message board the other day. I think this is a question I asked. Imagine if they would have done what they should have done in 19 and after the Virginia Tech game, bench Dan Book and put Phil Dracovic in the game. He starts the last five games of 19. He starts 20 and he starts 21. The reality is, is barring injury, Phil's not even here, and it doesn't matter. That's my stance. So um, it would have been Tyler. You would have had both. 
you'd had Phil would have groomed Tyler. And I think they would have got along. I think that would have, I think that would have worked out really well. So John's asking some tough ones today. I feel like I get like the sense sometimes like John gets like, takes the day off before the mailbag and like comes up with these like really good questions. And he's just like ready for us when we show up. Uh, so I, I appreciate that. Here's a draft question from Jason Burkhart. Draft question. How surprised were you that Sam Howe went as late as he did? And could he have done anything to help himself, like transferring to another school for his final year? It's a good one. I, I was I was surprised that he went that late. I mean, he didn't go to the fifth round. I thought he was definitely a day two kid at worst, right? And, I mean, I graded him out as a, a late two. So I think that the Washington commanders, I'm going to say Washington football team, got tremendous value in the fifth round, like no doubt about it. I, I like Sam. I, I, th- I don't think that the tools are fantastic, but I think he's a great deep ball thrower. I think he's a really tough kid, good enough athlete. He's, he, I think there's a good baseline for him as a football player. What could he have done, Jason? It, it was tough, man. He got put into a situation where Joshua Downs is a really good football player. Ty Chandler was a solid running back for them. But when you lose Deami Brown, Daz Newsom, Javante Williams, and Michael Carter one offseason, when you're a North Carolina, you're like, you're not in Alabama, right? Like you're in North Carolina. That was obviously a, a big factor in, I think, the regression. And Honestly, I think that Sam also pressed a little bit too hard yeah. at times, right? Like, I think he tried to do a little bit too much. And I think they and put too much on his shoulders this year as a, as sure. a coaching staff as well. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that, you know, you, you saw it at times. And I think there were some points where if you just kind of take what you see a little bit more and not hold on to the ball a little too long and, and put yourself in bad in worse situations, I, I think that there could have been some help to your draft stock a little bit. But as for transferring, I I, I, don't, I mean, maybe depends what the situation is, right? Like if he's dumped into a good situation that he trusts, but quarterbacks are kind of a, a victim of of the trust that you know, the players that are around him, right? Joshua Downs is a fantastic player. I I, mm-hmm. I would take him under Dame in a split second. But the fact yeah. of the matter is, is that, you know, through times last year, Sam Howell had only been playing with Joshua Downs a very small amount of time. So the trust right. wasn't always there on, on the full spectrum. So it's just unfortunate. I think Sam, though, will. I think he'll outplay the fifth round selection. Like that was a, a big, big value in that draft. That, and that opinion. was a, the one of the best spots to go to. From what I know of Scott Turner's offense, I think he fits it well. I think there's way less pressure on him now that he's a fifth round pick and he's the starting quarterback on that team. I mean, Taylor Heineke is the backup quarterback. I'm sorry, Sam Howell's better than Taylor Heineke. And oh, the yeah. starting quarterback is Carson Wentz, who will get hurt at some point in time the next year, or, or or his or his ego will get fractured again, and then sure, that'll be over. Right. his confidence, right. whatever you want to call it. You yeah. know, so I think it was a great thing. I think Sam's thing is, I think, I think it was put a lot of pressure on him. I thought they, this was a bad coaching job by North Carolina staff. I thought the offensive line regressed. They had some injuries. You know, the uh, what's the kid's name? The other receiver that played for a minute and got hurt. Kurt uh, Corrales. Caught, yes, Bo Corrales. Right? Or it's, it's Bo, right? Uh, and Bo then Corrales. Cox Brown didn't do anything for that. Like, there's just a lot that went wrong this year that hurt him, that hurt Sam. I, I like him. He was He's my favorite. I'm not saying he's the best. He's my favorite quarterback in the draft class. I just think the kid's a winner. I think the kid was held back by the the what was around him this year, and I think he pressed. I think he put too much on his shoulders to win, but he had to because if he didn't go – I mean, he's the only reason that Notre Dame game was competitive. If it wasn't for Sam Howe like doing Superman stuff, that game's a 30-point loss for North Carolina. Same with Pitt game. I mean, he made some plays in that Pitt game in the rain. You're like, this kid is a warrior, and he's like all by himself. you know. And, and uh, yes, I love Josh Downs, but also Josh Downs kind of player that – you know he's got to get going. I mean, he's got, he's a speed guy. He's got to run deep routes and vertical routes. He's not a guy that you can just throw a back shoulder to because you're getting pressured because your offensive line stinks. I think that hurts him too. Where last year with De'Ami Brown, he could hit the top of his drop, just let one go and let De'Ami run under it. De'Ami had a little bit of size to him. You know, he was a good, you know, one-on-one pass catcher and he wasn't a great player. Sam, I thought made him look better, but you know, he throws a phenomenal deep ball. He's a good kid. He's a winner. I think he got convinced that he needed to leave early, and I don't think he should have, in my opinion. I I, I don't necessarily believe that he was a, a no brainer one and done type of guy, you know, or three and done type of guy. He was a true junior. I think it was a mistake for him to come out right now, and I never understood why it was an automatic that he's going to leave. He's a true junior. He needed. He could have used more time, especially after the year he had. And North Carolina is probably going to have a pretty decent team around him this year, but. 
I also understand a lot of people left and he could to the second part of the question, he could have left. And I'll tell you this right now, if, if, if Tyler Buckner wasn't at Notre Dame, I'd take Sam Howell in a heartbeat. Cause I think Tommy Reese would be really good for Sam Howell because Tommy's offense would force Sam to, to, to do more reading pre post snap. He'd be working in a more NFL style system compared to an air raid. raid. I thought it'd be great. For him. <laughs> so if, if Tyler Buckner, let's say Tyler got hurt at the end of the season and he was going to be out for the year, and, and Sam Howe wanted to come to their name. Oh, absolutely. I'd sign me up, right? And, and I think it would have been good for Sam too. But I, I don't know if I – here's the thing. Knowing Sam and from everything I've heard about Sam, I don't think going somewhere else would have been an option for him. And this is a kid that's played in a bowl game. And he was like, I can't not play my – could you see that kid all of a sudden just leaving his team to go play for somewhere else because that was better for him? I think it was either NFL or go back to North Carolina, and I don't think going back to North Carolina was a super attractive proposition for him for a number of reasons. Yeah, and if you think about all the talent they lost over a two-year stretch, three thousand-yard running backs, the only two good linemen he had, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, did he have know, two? I thought he well, only had one. Two, the only two good he had, right? Because the other yes. kid got drafted. The Giants, like the Giants, drafted two linemen from North Carolina. And I, after the first, one, I told my, my buddy, I said, look, man, I like this kid. It was a good pick. I know their line sucked, but you move this kid into guard. Yeah. He's going to be a really good player, et cetera, et cetera. And then they picked second. I was like, dude, I got nothing. I got, I got oh, nothing. yeah, Marcus, Marcus McKee. I got nothing for you, man. Like, you picked two guys yeah. from North Carolina's offensive line. I, uh, I'm i sorry, buddy. I got nothing. I got nothing to make you feel better about that one. Michael Gardner, if you were game planning against Ohio State on defense, would you run more zone or man in order to slow down their passing attack? Both. Oh, yeah, I, I, yes. you got to mix it up. You, look, here's the key, right? And, and we'll, we'll get into more stuff this summer. We're still several months away from the game, right? Still four, a little less than four months away from the game. So it's a little early to dive too much into that. There's a lot of film I want to watch. But here, here, what I know of Ohio State and Notre Dame, here's the key, right? You have got to do whatever you can, pressure-wise, coverage-wise, mix-up-wise, all that stuff, to not let C.J. Stroud get comfortable. You can't. you got to make him think he's seeing one thing and show him something different. And sometimes you make him see one thing, and it, it is that thing. Because then if you confuse him enough, then he's going to, oh, they showed this, and then they rolled to this. So I'm thinking it's this. But no, it is that. And then he throws it to a guy that he doesn't think is going to be there, right? You've got to get him out of sync. And if you're if you just come out and play man the whole game, they will shred you. If you just come out and play zone the whole game, they will shred you. You have to mix it up, and, and, and that's the key. And there's got to be things you do to take away the quick game that allow you to get to the quarterback, right? That's the key because that's where I think Notre Dame has a big advantage. I'm, I watched the Rose Bowl again last night, Ryan. I'm like, this is the heavy foot is – heavy-footed group of tackles I've seen in, in Power 5. I mean, those guys, like, I'm watching Dewan Jones, and I'm like, there's no way that guy's going to be able to block Justin Adamiola, much less Isaiah Foskey yeah. with his pass sets. I'm like, this is terrible. Now, he's, yep. like, huge, and you got to run around him. But I'm like, man, it's just like – and I, I forgot how depleted that Utah defense was. Mm -hmm. I forgot about it. They, they had their running back playing corner yeah. during that game. Do you remember that? Like, yeah. I forgot about that. Did Devin like Devin look – did Devin Lloyd play that game? He did. He, Him and Clark Phillips play both game. played. But, like, their whole their secondary was decimated. They had COVID, guys mm -hmm. with COVID, guys out because of contact tracing, guys with injuries. Like, their defense was decimated. And then eventually Ohio State figured it out because there's only so much they could do. And uh, you got to be able to mix it up. That's a good question, Michael. And we'll, we'll get more into that as we get you know, into the summer. But you've, you've got to do – you got you just can't do one thing. There's not a defense in college football that's good enough to just line up and do what you do and stop Ohio State. There, there isn't one, and you got to mix it up. You want to hear? You want to hear a weird little tidbit, Brian? Before yeah, we move on, of course. You know, you just mentioned Clark Phillips. I'm actually wearing a Clark Phillips uh, sweatshirt nice. right now. Nice, nice. <laughs> you know, he could have. He was. Uh, he liked Notre Dame a lot, but Clark Lee. Uh, Clark Lee didn't oh, think he was small. long enough. Yeah. Ugh, so. Ugh. Yep. Yep. He's. Uh, so he, now he's have a, you ever seen he's... Clark Phillips? Yeah. Nah, man. He's. Yeah. Does I he not look Phillips. like Sean Sean Crawford's little brother? Like in the face, a little bit, a little bit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like I was like, "Hey, yeah. what's Sean Crawford?" Like when he was on a visit, I was like, "Women is it was for a spring practice," and I was like, "Why is Sean Crawford standing on the sidelines talking to?" I was like, "Oh, that's not Sean Crawford. That's that's Clark Phillips." And they look very, very similar. Very, very similar. I yeah. still that's one regret. Um, I I would have loved to see what Sean Crawford could have done before the injuries. He was right. so good in high school. He was so he explosive athletic. He still tested really well at his pro yes. day, didn't he? Yes. Yeah. 
which yeah. is insane when you consider he tore he tore his Achilles, he tore his ACL, I think twice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like you remember that game where his like elbow went like sh- went the wrong direction. Like, well, his career's over, and he was like back in two weeks. That is one <laughs> tough little kid. Like that kid that was, was a freaking warrior. I mean, I I don't like using that phrase a lot for football players, but that kid fits it. I, I could not I believe mean, when he came back for that last year, man. I was like, wow, this dude, he loves football, man. <laughs> he, <laughs> he loves, loves football, it. and he did. Yeah. And that's the thing that that's because if you ever met Sean, he's a great kid. Oh, and if you see the interviews he's doing, like when he's going to different, I mean, he's a phenomenal young man. It's just he had terrible luck, but there are to, to sh- that's how good he was that he could have corners are not DBs, especially five nine DBs are not supposed to be able to suffer three season ending lower body injuries and still be decent like serviceable players and he was you know i mean he was limited to bear, compared to what he was but he could still play at notre dame and it just says what i mean think about what he could have been without just take two of them away <laughs> you know what i mean like let him have the acl as a freshman but that's it he'd have been so good he was really good against texas that year if you go back and watch i mean he had two picks but he was good in coverage and he was a really good player. Irish fan 15 says, Hey, hey, IB, how would you guys compare Dante Moore and Tyler Buckner as juniors in high school? I mean, I I I, I mean, just looking at them I, again, they're just completely different players, right? Like mm-hmm. Tyler Buckner is just a dynamic, dynamic dude from the quarterback position as an athlete. And I think that Dante Moore is a good athlete, but he's not the same type of guy. Like you're not gonna run power read you're not going to run quarterback counters like quarterback sweeps you're not going to do all that stuff like you can with tyler buckner but i will say that dante moore is even though i thought i thought tyler was like pretty far along from a technical perspective as far mm-hmm. as like you know going through reads and stuff but dante is just he's a he's yeah. a different cat in that regard like he's one of the yeah. best like processors i've ever seen of a junior so i think tyler has better upside as far as a, a dual threat option Dante is a little bit stronger of an arm and just a little bit of a more natural thrower, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's where that experience part comes from. You know, Tyler missing, what would Tyler have been like if he didn't miss his whole junior sophomore season? Right. I mean, those are things that you look at, but Don, Don, they're, they're very so like, they're both really smart players, like anticipation and all that. But I think, Don, I think Dante is the more natural passer for sure. Tyler is a far more dynamic runner. They're very comparable. Uh, as far as impact players, I had them both as five stars as juniors. And so there's not a huge difference. Tyler went down for away from a five star because he didn't play as a senior. And partly because of that crazy camp performance he had where like his throwing motion was all jacked up. Like I, that was weird to me, but you know, Dante's the better prospect just because like, as far as a, a pure quarterback and it's, you know, he, he's as good of a, uh, he's got as good of a mind for the game as I've seen. Like I talked about Bryce Young the other day. The, the closest thing I've seen to it is, is Dante Moore, in my opinion. You know, now the difference is, is between Bryce and Dante. And the reason I would, I would say Bryce was ahead of Dante at the same age is because Bryce also was allowed to attack down the field a lot more. And Dante isn't allowed to do that. Like if they would open up that offense a little bit, I think you'd see Dante even take another step in regards to that. And then I understand why they do it, all that, but I would like to see them let turn him loose down the field even more because I think that's because when they do do it, you can see his mind working quickly. Like he's a really smart, instinctive kid, and and that's what I think. You know, the comp to him, that's why Bryce Young is the good comp for him. I just think Dante is a little bit more physically gifted, uh, in my opinion. But Tyler Buckner's no slouch, and they're different players. So that's why it's, it's kind of funny. People are like, well, when Dante shows up, you know, Tyler better watch out. I'm like, well, okay, maybe right, but you know, Tyler Buckner's a pretty darn good football player. You know what I mean? Like he put up he put up monster numbers as a junior in high school. He he was a he was a special player. It's a good question. Here's an interesting one, Ryan. That I I curious to what you think about this. It's free for all Friday, which means they can ask whatever they want. Corey D asks, better movie, Shawshank Redemption or Schindler's List? Shawshank Schindler's List opinion. for me. I didn't like Shawshank really? Redemption. No, really? I Why? I yeah, I just now nah. I, I Morgan Freeman did a great job in that movie and the rest of it. I just I'm, first of all, I'm not a huge Tim Robbins fan, although he's been in a couple of my you know really good movies. I I really liked him in Nothing to Lose. I don't know if you ever seen that with Martin Lawrence. It's pretty good. And then, of course, he was in Bull Durham. But I'm not a huge fan of him. Uh, I just I don't know. I just didn't like it. I didn't it just it was creepy to me. Uh, oh, Schindler's List, I think part of it, too, is Schindler's List is I mean, it's based on a true story. And and as a student of history, I I 
I know what, what that was like, you know, like what that period was like and what it meant and all that. And the true story is actually more fascinating than the movie was in my opinion. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't really like Shawshank to be honest with you. I, I know I'm like in the minority there and that's a bad there's a couple take. people like hit that unfollow button, but I just didn't like it. I just didn't like it's it. A bad, that's a bad take. It's bad yeah, everybody's entitled to their opinions. Uh, they call me <laughs> gravy. What is your favorite game from each era that you watched? Mine is a toss up between Clemson regular season 2020 and Virginia 2015. I am too young to remember the feeling involved in the Weiss area. He's real young. Um, favorite game of the different eras. So I'm going to go with the Lou Holtz era. My favorite game was 93 Florida State of the Holtz era. Miami is a close second. West Virginia would be third because that was the title game. But that Florida State game was a Great game. And I was a little older. I could appreciate it more. It's 15 compared to 10. Favorite game of the tie era was beating Michigan in 98. That was that was that was my favorite game of the tie era. Uh, I'm passing the Bob Davy era on purpose. Uh favorite <laughs> win of the Charlie era. Boy, that's a good it'd be Michigan State 2006. The comeback in the in the rain at Michigan State. That's probably my favorite, my favorite game of the Charlie Weiss era. What would what would yours be? Do you are you do you have a, a recollection of that? Yeah, I remember Charlie. It was it was a nice two year run there. I don't know if there's a game though that really stands out. Because yeah. they were down like thirty eight seventeen to Michigan State on the road. I, I don't remember and, that one that yeah. well. Who's who yeah. was the quarterback for Michigan State? Was oh, it, Drew Stanton, was, I think. Was it still Drew Stanton? I, I remember Stanton so. beat Stanton definitely beat them once. Yeah, let me let me look that up. But yeah. I, I thought it was Drew Stanton. But yeah, they were up thirty eight seventeen over Notre Dame. And they had gotten a big lead over Notre Dame uh, the previous year. Notre Dame came back, took it overtime, and then lost to Michigan State. So it's kind of nice to kind of get a little bit of payback. But I, I could be wrong. But, yeah, they were they were down 24-7 in the second quarter. Notre Dame scored. Then they went up. They were down 31-14 at halftime. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. They were down 37-21. to And then Brady hit Samarja. It was like a slant. Samarja caught it, cut back out for a touchdown. Then he hit a beautifully placed back shoulder throw to Raymond McKnight for a touchdown. Hit Raymond for two touchdowns. And then, yeah, Drew Stanton got picked off by Terrell Lambert with 253 left, ran it back for – that's the one where where John L. Smith is, like, running and he has, like, this, like, stops and he's got, like, this sad, like, lost look on his face, which is like kind of sums up John L. Smith's coaching career. Um, yeah, and they won 40 to 37. Yeah, they're they're down 37 21 and hit John Carlson up the seam for a touchdown. That was a great game. Great. I mean, Brady made tons of plays that game. Raymond made a couple great catches. Samarja made that great play at the end. That was a that was a fun game. That was a really fun I, game. I, I, I kind of liked um Drew Stanton, by the way. I don't know if you've ever talked about yeah. that, but I, I liked him as a player. He was not good that game. He went 10 no. of 22 for 114 yards, two touchdowns, and two picks. Uh, they ran for a whole lot. Here's a name from the past. Uh, Jehu Coldcrick was the oh, Colcrick. rush for 100 yards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was a good player. And then Javon Ringer was on that team too. They ran – It was, but it was like pouring down rain the whole second half. It was like pouring down rain. So that's the other thing yeah. that's miraculous about the Notre Dame comeback is Brady's doing all this in pouring down rain. <laughs> you should go – like if you get some time tonight, like pop that game in. It was a – it would go to the second half. How about that? Start in the second half. <laughs> It'll be make Man, you feel he, a little bit better. Cole Crick was one of the best uh, oversized running backs behind yeah. Javorski Lane from Texas A&M, yeah. though. But yeah, he had eight carries for 111 yards that game. Cole Crick did. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Eight, eight, eight carries for 111 yards. I might have said catches. I meant carries. Eight ca- eight carries for. 100. Yeah. Matt Tran threw a touchdown pass in that game. Huh. Yeah. You have to go back and watch it. You were young. Yeah, 2006, it was at Michigan State. You should go back and watch it. It was a, it was a classic. And then, uh, actually, we'll, we'll finish, finish this one. Um, favorite favorite game. So let's go with BK. Let's go pre-2016 and then post-2016. Pre-2016, mm. Post-2016 is easy. It's USC 2017. Yeah, that absolute yeah. curb stomping of a highly ranked USC team was a lot of fun. Yeah. The pre pre twenty pre twenty fifth pre twenty sixteen. I'd probably have there's a couple, but I'd probably have to go Stanford twenty twelve and then Oklahoma twenty twelve or my t- kind of tied. Because Stanford, Stanford was like Stanford had just been killing Notre Dame for like four years in a row coming into that game. That was a really good Stanford team, and Notre Dame had a lot of adversity that game. You know, Everett gets knocked out, all that kind of stuff. 
and then uh, it was a it was a it was a weird game. And then of course Oklahoma was 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 great because you know you go on the road. It's it's in Oklahoma, and it just was kind of like yeah, Notre Dame's back moment, you know. And uh-huh. uh, those are those are that's probably my my two favorite pre twenty. Anytime you beat Miami, it's fun. So you could look at the you know the Sun Bowl in two thousand eleven, the curb stomping of Miami in twenty twelve. Uh, beating them in 2016, but you know none of those teams are really that good, so it doesn't mean a whole lot. Stanford and Oklahoma that year were really, really good. Stanford 2012, that was the one where uh, Stephon Taylor got stopped near the goal line, right? Is that yeah, the one? Overtime. Yeah, overtime. Yeah. Yeah, Tommy that came game. in, that was a great threw game. a touchdown pass to TJ Jones in overtime to win it. Yeah, it was so, a great game. Yeah. I yeah, remember was, that and, one. And they, were, they ended up fifth that year. I mean, that was a really good Stanford team. Really good Stanford team. Uh, post- 2016, Ryan. Did you agree with me on the USC 2017 game? Yeah, it'd be USC or it'd be Cle- when they beat Clemson with DJ. I guess that would be a clo- a, like a number two probably for me. That it's game not, no. always. I, I've never loved that game. It was a great win, but a you beat them with the backup quarterback. And I don't know. Like I know there were students there, but it just a college football game just uh, isn't the same without fans in the state. I'm sorry, it's just not. It's it just. It's just not. And, and NBC actually did their best to try to pump in some sound. You know what I mean? Like it sounded mm-hmm. like they were pumping in some sound, but it just it wasn't. It wasn't the same. So it just took some of that. That's the thing I loved about the 93 and the 88 games over Miami and Florida, Florida State and then Miami is I mean, the crowd was such a big part of that game. Back right. then, you could get flagged for the crowd being too loud. Like they would warn you to be quiet when you're when the other team was on offense. And if you didn't, you'd get flagged. It was crazy. It was crazy. John Leahy, I heard on another podcast that Notre Dame is over the 85 scholarship limit with the transfers arriving. Is this true? And what will Notre Dame do? It is true. Uh, don't know what they're going to do. Uh, you'll have somebody on medical or someone else transfer. See, guys can still transfer. They just can't sit out. And and the other option is, worst case scenario, is they take a walk-on scholarship away. It Because sco- walk-ons are kind of only guaranteed through that school year. They're not guaranteed scholarships for next year. So that's the other thing they could do. So it's not a not an ideal situation at all. So yes, that is accurate. Irishman seven one one four. I think this D line group gets a boost because this is going back to the the, the twenty twenty three class. If they get Jason Moore and Devin Houston, mm-hmm. I think this D line group gets a boost because Michigan really wanted all of them. <laughs> thought they were going to get some of them. That and positional flexibility take it up a notch for me. Agree, agree. I mean, yeah. hey. Hey, anytime you beat Michigan for anything, I'm happy about it, right? So, yes. Well, and, and practically speaking, Ryan, I mean, there's the fan part of us that both loves kicking Michigan in the teeth. But the other part of it, too, is is like you're beating – you're kicking Michigan's butt for a year after they just had two All-American edge players. Right. They've had how many – I mean, Notre Dame hasn't had a first-round defensive line – or defensive end taken since 1998. Michigan's had three or two in the last however many years and would have had a third if David Ajabo doesn't tear his knee up. Where did he end up going? Was he sec- second round? Sec- second round to the uh, Baltimore Ravens. He's Great. a first-round pick Great. if he doesn't get hurt. Are you agree top with tw- that? Top, okay. top 20 pick if he doesn't get hurt, yeah. Right, and and Notre Dame hasn't produced a guy like that in 20 years. You know, you know what I mean? So, like, it, over 20 years. And, and so, with all that being true, coming off a playoff team, kicked Ohio State's butt last year, won the Big Ten, all that, and Notre Dame is still kicking the absolute crap out of them on the recruiting trail. I think that that isn't just a, as a fan. It's what we've said is they have to become the premier team in the Midwest first, and they're not. You just you're leaving Michigan in the rear view, even with a playoff appearance. You're leaving Penn State is is they can't even see your backside anymore. It's now okay, Ohio State. Focus on Ohio State now. But that's important because Michigan had a chance this past year to gain ground on Notre Dame. Between beating them in 19 and then the playoff run, Michigan had a chance to gain ground on Notre Dame, Ryan. And the fact that Notre Dame is kicking the mess out of them on the recruiting trail right now negates that. Now, a lot of that's Harbaugh's fault. How he handled this offseason has just been just one of the worst, like borderline fireball offense to me. Like you just ruined our entire offseason because because of the way you handled this whole thing. Like it was bad. I don't I don't it's not getting talked about enough in my opinion how bad he botched this offseason for Michigan. A team that just went to the playoff with that name recognition should not be recruiting this poorly in my opinion. I don't know what you think about that, Ryan. No, nah, it, it's it's I mean like you said it's a fireable offense. It's there's no there's no excuse for it. I mean to be very honest and 
Yeah, no, nah, I, I, especially because I mean, what 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 recruit in this cycle can you look at and say? Because, like you said, Midwest powers supposedly, right? Michigan versus Notre Dame, it's a historic thing. What prospect or recruit in this class in 2023 is Michigan going to beat out Notre Dame for that Notre Dame wants? Is there any? Is there any? I can't think of a single one. Mm-mm. No, there, there's the closest that they were going to have. I'm actually going to look up their current class. The closest they were going to have, they thought was going to be Devin Houston. Right. Right. And, you know, we'll find out tomorrow how that goes. But right now, I, I wouldn't project that. We talked about that before you got on the show, Ryan, is, you know, Notre Dame is, has done a great job and put themselves in position as the team to beat. Yep. I'm looking at the list now. Samaj, Samaj Morgan, nope. Cole Cabanas, Cabana, no. Benjamin Hall, no. Raylan Wilson, Notre Dame offered him but never recruited him. And then Brooks Barr. I mean, the only reason Notre Dame recruited him was because Mike Elson recruited him. And once Mike right. Elson left, Notre Dame stopped recruiting him. And he signed with Mike with Mike Elson at, at Michigan. So and he have, was never even he was never even offered by Notre Dame. No, Brooks Barr. No, because yeah. Mike Elson's the only one that wanted him. He's a nice player, but Notre Dame had their height sights set on better prospects. You know, so you've looked at guys that 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 you know in the Notre Dame class, there's there's been a lot of guys that Michigan wanted and ended up not having a chance with, right? I mean, so they wanted Bubakar Traore, right? They they tried to get on Brendan Vernon, had no chance. They thought they were gonna get Preston Center, right? And then mm-hmm. they, then after it was going to Notre Dame, it was like, well, no, no, we really didn't want him anyway. <laughs> they tried to recruit. Drake Bowen, they tried to they they thought they had a shot with Sam Pendleton right until the moment Notre Dame got involved. And you know, I'm looking at this now. I think they offered a Don Shula. They tried to get in with Peyton Bowen because they thought that there's still Michigan reporters that say that they have a chance to flip Peyton Bowen from Michigan from Notre Dame, which is just patently stupid. That's so I'm not saying Peyton's guaranteed to go to Notre Dame, but if he doesn't go to Notre Dame, he's not going to Michigan. <laughs> he's going to like right? Oklahoma or something. Yeah, yeah and, and exactly. I don't see anybody on the list now. Dante Moore, no. Mm-hmm. They, they try to get Jay Lamar. They wanted him, and that's that's not working out for him. And they've kind of gone in a different direction now. Ronan Hannafin, they wanted. I don't know if they've offered Great House or not. Brent, Brent, Brandon said in the chat that Michigan fans apparently think that they're getting Jalen Brown from Florida. That's that's what he said. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see about that. Uh, that'd be a great pickup for him, though. I mean, oh, that'd be a great sure. pickup for him. For sure. Uh, and, and I would consider that beating Notre Dame because part of the reason Notre Dame backed off of him because he just didn't seem that interested in Notre Dame. So uh, if he picks Michigan, that, that'd be a good win for him. But, you know, I, I honestly can't think of anybody else that, that they have a shot at other than Devin Houston. I, I really can't. I can't think of any DBs. I can't think of any of the linebackers on the board. I, I really can't. I mean, Sam, Samuel and Pemba visited there, and I think he liked it, but I don't see him picking Michigan. But maybe that's another opportunity. But I, I really can't think of a single kid that Michigan and Notre Dame like, – Charles uh, Jagasaw would be one. That would be the one guy that I could see them potentially beating Notre Dame for. I said this – we talked about this before the show, Ryan. I was asked to give my opinion on on several recruits. But I said, you know, I'm right now I'm a, I'm a seven for Charles Jagasaw. Mm-hmm. I think Michigan is – I wasn't a nine a month ago. I think Michigan's mm-hmm. made enough of a of a run at him that like I still feel Notre Dame's going to get him, but they've put themselves in the mix. I think I think that'd be the only guy that I think Notre Dame wants and is after that Michigan might have a chance of beating them for. What are your, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. I, yeah, the Jalen Brown thing. I'm sorry, I'm still laughing about that a little bit internally. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you for putting it in there, Brandon. Yeah, I mean, the uh, Jagasaw is one of those that we've talked about this a ton. Teams that have a clear favorite – or, sorry, players that have a clear favorite program and don't pull the trigger – trigger? But don't pull the trigger. <laughs> I don't you know why I drove over there, man. Like, uh, do I need to call like 911 it. and send them to your house? It felt, it felt like it, man. I don't know what happened right there. But <laughs> <laughs> players that, that have a clear favorite and don't pull the trigger, that leaves you uneasy because there's mm-hmm. – there's leaves opportunity – Right. And mm-hmm. that makes you unsettled. So, yes, I, right. I think that that's a player that I would like that one to be over sometime soon. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yes. Right. right. Yep. That's that's a that's a good one. Let's get down to Charlie Weiss's last belt loop. Thank you for the super chat. Very, very much. Weird question. But what Notre Dame coach won a natty would be considered overrated? 
Thanks, guys, for the hard work. Have a good weekend, IB family. Well, listen, here's here's what I'll tell you. Uh, I only – I was alive. I was not alive. I was alive during the Dan Devine era. I was a baby, but I was not alive when he won a title. He was he won a title the year before I was born. So I can't possibly say that Dan Devine was overrated. I will relay conversations that I've had with Lou Samoji about him that a lot of people feel he won based off of the players that he inherited from uh, Era Parsegian. Right. And there was a lot of guys on that 77 title team, like, like Ross Browner and some of those guys that were recruited by era and, and that they weren't, that he didn't, he didn't, he should have won more based on what the talent he inherited is what people will say. So from folks I know that were older and follow the team back then, they would tell you Dan Devine. I don't think there's, I don't think no one is going to tell you Newt Rockney's overrated. No one's going to tell you Frank Leahy's overrated. Lou Samoji would say that the fact that Era Parsija went 500 at Northwestern at that time was one of the best coaching jobs in college football. You know, um, I'd be like, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to think of like the worst. I'd be like taking over, I'm trying to think like Rutgers right now in the Big Ten and going to bowl games, you know, like all, all the time. It's like, it's, it, they were bad. It's what Lou says. And then he comes to Notre Dame. He was a great coach in Notre Dame. Lou Holtz was, was not overrated at all because Lou had success other places. I mean, right. he won an Orange Bowl at Arkansas. He had some good years with NC State. I mean, took Minnesota to a bowl game when they weren't that good. So I would say that based on what I've been told, it would be it, the only one option would be Dan Devine. Yeah, so, no, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Josh Miller says, do you guys think that the national championship teams get overdrafted because they play in games at the end that everyone sees like the owners fall in love with a kid while watching the natty? I do think there's something to that, especially when it's a national, when it's a L O it's an, it's an sec team. Yeah. I, I do. I do think that if, if LSU, if you, if Georgia gets pounded by Alabama, I don't know if they, I don't think they'd have 15 kids drafted. And, and I've said this before, you may disagree, Ryan, you're a draft guy. These GMs and coaches and scouts, they're human beings with emotions too. They can sure. be swayed by, by uh, you know, I, I've pointed out, if you go back and look at the last five years, you look at the top three rounds of the draft and the percentage of SEC picks, especially round one, and then you compare it to the percentage of SEC guys that are on all pro teams, it, it's it's way, way more non-SEC guys in pro bowl team or uh, all pro teams than there are drafted in the first round. So I do think the SEC guy. I think Alabama's had guys overdrafted for years because I think sometimes the the the, the hole, you know, is better than the nest, than necessarily the individual parts, right? And that I just think that to be true. And so I do think there are several guys for Georgia that got overdrafted. If Georgia goes eight and four this year, Ryan, do you think Trayvon Walker is the number one pick in the NFL draft? I don't. No, no, because if they go eight and four, that means a lot of those guys didn't take step forward, right? Like they weren't great as good as they. Were it could have been players, other guys. You know? It could have been Stetson Bennett sucked. You know, well, I just he, I think man. when 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 guys look at teams that are successful, they say that I think guys get lifted up, right? Like I just well put it to you like yeah. this: if Trayvon Walker did what he did during the seasons, production wise, and at the combine for Vanderbilt, do you think he's the number one overall pick? Mm, not number one. He would have been overdrafted okay. though, either way with those athletic right. testing numbers. But no, right. I, I agree. I agree with it because there's a stigma around being a winner, right? Like the right. quote unquote winner. And that, that so would let's, have, that would have let's definitely draft John Fitzpatrick. Right. <laughs> well, that's, that's bad. Let's make Quay that's Walker bad. for, I'll make this now see Quay Walker, maybe cause his, his, his numbers he's are talented. Really good. Yeah. He's talented. Yeah. yeah. Cause we saw that with the kid from Kentucky last year. Right. Yes. I mean, but that many, I just don't. I don't think it would. And yeah, we saw it with like no, LSU. I buy that. Yeah, yeah, we saw it with LSU in, in the 2020 draft. There's there were some guys from the LSU team that were drafted exactly where they should have been. I mean, that that was a there were some I mean, Jamar Chase, Joe Burrow, Justin mm -hmm. Jefferson. But there were some guys that got picked probably a little bit higher than they probably should have. I think the Broncos are probably regretting that they drafted Lloyd Cushenberry in the third round at this point in time. Like, man, maybe we should have waited a round or two more. You know, That's true. That's just the reality of it. And you know, like we've seen it, we've seen it in the past. It so I. I think so. Now, does that mean that Georgia would have only had seven guys drafted if they didn't win a title? No, I'm not saying that. I'm right. not saying that at all. They still would have had a lot of guys drafted, but it would have been like more normal, like last year, like 10. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, I just – I think it's the combination of them winning a title plus them being an SEC team. That, that's yeah. that's what I think. I'd buy that. 
I buy that. When you said the Alabama overdrafted thing, is it bad that the first person I thought of was um was uh, Alex Leatherwood going 16th to the uh, – Oh, LA, I mean, LA everybody knew that Alabama. one. Everybody knew that one. Well, Everyone like the Ryan knew. Anderson. I mean, we could we could have such a long list of guys that were drafted in the first round that did almost nothing in the NFL. I mean, James Carpenter. I mean, DJ Fluker's been a nice player, but nothing like where he was drafted. Ryan no. Anderson it got cut by the Redskins like before. It was a second round pick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, so it, it's 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 been it, yeah, it, it's a lot. It, it, there's a lot Drake, of guys. Drake Kirkpatrick and yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of guys, yeah. man. Of guys. Real quick here. Um, Hulk strongest with a super chat. Thank you for that. Uh, what can you, what can you guys, uh, what do you guys think about the new receiver, Joshua Manning? So we were asked yeah. about this um, earlier, but he did a super chat. So I wanted to give you a chance to kind of maybe dive into a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, so Hulk strongest, if you're, if you're not on the message board, I, I started doing these little, instant breakdowns types of pieces on the players that are offered recently. So if you want to go on there, I have a little more of an in-depth kind of look into Joshua Manning, who is of course the wide receiver out of Missouri. I mean, kind of basically the, the biggest highlights of, of Joshua for me is that the fact that he's listed at six foot, 390 pounds, he's got a really nice frame and he's very, very explosive. He's got long strides. You look into his track background. He's a 23 plus foot long jumper. He's also a kick returner for the team that averaged like 42 yards per kick. So this is a very explosive player. I think that there is a huge upside to him as a boundary receiver because I think that he can kind of get on top of defenders and he can really win vertically a ton, which is kind of the biggest selling point. The offense that he plays in right now, though, the only the only thing that you're going to have to look at with him is that he has some flexibility to him. I think he can run routes, but in the offense he runs right now, he runs a fade or he runs a screen. That's all he does mm-hmm. right now, pretty much all across the film, at least on his highlights. That's all he does. So you're going to need to develop the finer points of playing receiver, but from a height, weight, speed combination, Joshua Manning's a really impressive player. I was very, very impre- mm-hmm. impressed because some of the recruiting services do not have high grades on him right now. A couple do, but a couple mm-hmm. do not. Get to a few more here. We do have a super chat from Alberto. Thank you, Alberto. Just my, our Spanish friend. Just a question, Brian. The other day you said there's a difference between being the leader and the team to beat. Would you mind explaining? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I would necessarily say if there's a difference between being the leader and the team to beat. I'd have to kind of think to the context of what I said. But basically, if if you're the leader, it's you're the team everybody has to beat, right? It's different than being committed. If a kid's committed, there's it, a little bit more of a connection there. If you're just the leader, it's kind of like, okay, you're the announced leader. Now everybody's all the other six teams the kids looking at are all zeroing in on you. I think that's kind of where I'm I'm coming from with that, Ryan. And I know you got to leave here. There's a couple ones I wanted to get to you here before we go. And and look, we're not going to sure. get to as many questions today as we normally did. We had a couple that went super long answers, and I apologize <laughs> for that. There were some great questions early, uh, and and I can't believe we're at three hours already. Like this this has been a great <laughs> show. It's been a fun show, and I apologize. I'm not going to get to many questions, but we will have a show tomorrow. And we will open it up for Q&A after we talk about uh, whatever the decision that Devin Hughes is going to make. First of all, Craig Daughtry, this is, hurts my heart. Craig says, first, Brian doesn't <laughs> like gravy. Now Shawshank Redemption. I'm going to have to rethink my membership. Please don't. We can all <laughs> we can all have one love. It's Notre Dame, right? Just because you may not like my movie taste or the fact that I don't like gravy, we can still all be friends and family. I won't we, we judge can, you. We can fix this, Craig. Yes. We can fix this. No, no, I'm pretty sure you're not going to fix that. Um, I just don't like that movie. Here's a good one that I wanted to get to you though, Ryan, because this is kind yeah. of a draft question. And I'm not sure if you have a feeling on this. Irish Gordian Knott says if Nicholas Pettit Freer goes to Notre Dame and is coached by Harry Heastan, do you think he gets developed into a first round pick? I thought that kid was going to be a star. I'm going to add one more caveat that has to be a part of this. Yeah. Matt Bayless. Well, that's what I was going to say is I think, I think Matt Bayless is just as important as, as working with Harry Eastand, honestly, it's, it's, it was never a talent issue with a guy like Nicholas Petit Freer, who went, I think in the third round to the Tennessee Titans, if I remember correctly this year, Mm -hmm. it's about his frame. I just don't love his frame. And I think that Ohio state put too much weight on that frame and that Mm -hmm. hurt his foot quickness and his flexibility. I just did not think that they did him any justice. I mean, that kid coming out of high school, you were like, wow, that kid is a fleet-footed mover at offensive tackle. And then all of a sudden he gradu- he leaves Ohio State, and you're just like, he's kind of a plotter. Like he's not mm-hmm. a the same athlete he was. So if he's on a staff that has both Matt Bayless and Harry Heastan, I think there's a there's a good chance that that happens because I think that mm-hmm. Matt Bayless would have kept him. Brian said this before, like 295, and would have kept him looking 
at a, and a if he did get to 300 or 305, it would have happened over a four year period, kind of like Zach Martin. He was like 290 and then 295 and then finally at 300. And that wasn't even under Matt Bayless. But Paul, exactly. that was one thing Paul Longo was good about. He didn't pile weight on guys. That's one thing I'll give him credit for. He didn't pump weight on guys. He believed in explosiveness and all that too. He just wasn't as good as Matt Bayless at it, especially later in his tenure. But yeah, if he even if he did get to that weight, Ryan, and three fifteen was always way too much. If he yes. did get to three bills, it would have been like in his final year. So mm-hmm. I, I agree with you. I think if he would have come to Notre Dame with Bayless and Harry Heastan, I think he's a first round pick. Yes. I yeah. Do. He sh- he should he should have been a 300, 295 to three hundred pound offensive tackle who's going to excel in 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 wide zone and inside zone schemes. Like that should have been be a him. great he, pass pro guy. He should have exactly. been an elite pass pro guy. And he was not at all because he lost his foot speed to your points. Yes. I mean, exactly. And, and that was his game. Athleticism was his game. There's no doubt. And there was one more that would quickly get to Ryan yep. before you get out of here. It's a recruiting question from Keith Wiegand. Is Osbury the only linebacker you're recruiting now? I put this in there. Cause obviously we talked about Samuel Pemba, but then I got a text from you during the show. Uh, yes. about another linebacker. So go ahead and answer that one before you head out of here. Yeah, I mean, so he no, he's not the only linebacker that's on the board left. Samuel and Pemba, like Brian just said, they're recruiting as a rover out of IMG Academy is a player that they really like, obviously have liked for a long time. Darian Gallet's another guy out of Texas that they like a ton. I just talked to his coach this, um, this afternoon. He's planning to make Notre Dame one of his official visits. But those have not been finalized quite yet. But you should you should not be surprised if when he does set up his visits that Notre Dame is one that Darian Gillette is going to be taken. That's what it sounds like right mm-hmm. now anyway, unless something changes. So we should be seeing Darian Gillette on campus, you know, during the summer at some point, it does seem. So those are three of the top names. Seems that Notre Dame has maybe transitioned a little way from Tamir Robinson, but the, I think that those three guys specifically are guys that you should keep an eye on moving forward for the linebacker board. Mm-hmm. Good one. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I really, man, Darren Gillette is a freak, man. He, his athleticism is insane. He is, but it, n- nobody's going to surpass my, surpass Jaden Osbury is my favorite linebacker though on the board right now. They're just, he's just got things that you just can't teach, man. I absolutely love it. Like <laughs> I just keep thinking Jonathan Vilma, Jonathan Vilma, Jonathan Vilma. Every time I watch that kid play, that's just what keeps <laughs> popping in my head. So Ryan, that's I got fair. a couple more. I'm going to answer here. I know you got to run uh, and, and go get the little one. So I appreciate you joining us today. And uh, with us for a couple hours. So I really appreciate that, man. Very, absolutely, very, guys. Very much. I got about six more here, five more here. I want to get to here real quick before I get out of here. Let's get Ryan off the chat. There we go. Uh, John A1, this is a good one. Who would you say was the most impactful college defensive player? Manti Taylor in 2022, and Dominican Sue, Charles Woodson, Deion Sanders, the field. So, like, I'm only going to go, John, with my lifetime of that group. I got to put Manti fourth. Manti had a great year in 2012, but what and Dominican Sue, when he was in his prime in college, was a monster. Charles Woodson in his last year at Michigan was an insane talent because he didn't just impact you on defense. He could return punts, he could play receiver. But even as a as a defensive player, I mean, the interception he had against Michigan State was insane. I mean, he could literally take your best receiver out of the game. I mean, literally, you don't lock down like true lockdown corners don't come along very often. Dion was a little bit before my time, so I I can't really speak to Dion. I mean, I remember Dion Sanders from the standpoint of I remember that he played at Florida State. You know, he, he was obviously played in 88, but I can't tell you that I watched a lot of him. Like, I read about him in magazines. Like, obviously, I mean, I, I watched him on Sports Center. I mean, I knew Dion at Florida State. And, but as far as like seeing him enough to be able to compare him to the other three, it would just be on reputation alone. And I don't think it's fair. So I'm going to take Dion out just because I just don't, I don't remember him as much as I do the other guys of those three guys. The most impactful was probably Woodson because of all he could do and Dominic and Sue because he could just – I mean, Manti was somewhat reliant on what was in front of him, and that's that's just the nature of being a linebacker. That's not a knock on Manti. And we saw this in the pit game when Lewis Nix didn't play in the first half. I mean, they were getting to Manti and chopping him the whole first half. And, again, that's part of the game. Whereas with Sue, I mean, he could just take a game over. He could just dominate the line of scrimmage, and, I mean, you couldn't do anything about it. I, I think Dominic and Sue, and I'd be curious kind of what everybody else in the chat thinks – 
of that group. But Indomitian Sioux to me uh, was was just a phenomenal, phenomenal player and, and dominant, impactful. Just could take a game over. He was really, really impressive. I'd, I'd be curious what you all think. And, and for some of those that are older than me and remember Dion, I'd love to hear what you think. You know, of those Manti 2012, Namak and Sue, Charles Woodson, Deion Sanders, or the field, is there somebody else? Because, like, if you were to ask Lou Samoji this question, I'm pretty sure he would – he'd probably start talking about Ross Browner. I mean, I, I've heard Ross Browner was an insanely good player uh, in college. But, I mean, Ross Browner's career – Notre Dame career was over before I was born. I can't really talk about that. But I, I'd be curious what people's – people's are, are to that. Absolutely. Kevin Hardy says, I've been meaning to ask this since the burner account mentioned it, but what would it mean for the program if Jack and Father Jenkins were to retire in a couple of years? Well, with Jack, it just depends on who they replace him with. I mean, you know, I don't personally like Jack Swarbrick all that much, um, just in my few brief interactions, but I think he's been a really good athletic director for the most part. He's been really good for the college game. I mean, he he was the driving force, the driving force behind getting not letting the super conferences happen he's done a lot of good things in their name there's some things he would have done different just like there's people think there's th that i would do things different doing my job you, no one's perfect and you're always going to find things to fault but i think he's done a, a really good job as the at at notre dame for football I, I don't follow the other sports close enough to know that but for football he's done a phenomenal job facilities for athletics as a whole he's done a phenomenal job and look in the last 10 years notre dame's won national championships in women's basketball They've won. They've gone to the Frozen Four. They continue to be, you know, fencing, do what they do. The baseball teams turn, you know, get re, getting going. The men's basketball team was to a couple of lead eights. There's a lot of sports in Notre Dame that have been successful in the last ten years. Football has been really good. I don't think you can not give him some credit for that. And and so uh, I think he's done a great job. So if you're going to replace him, you have to replace him with someone else who's very, very, very competent. Not just competent, but very, very good at the job. Father Jenkins, I'm just going to say this briefly and move on from it because I don't really want this to start something, but I I think it will be better for Notre Dame when he's gone. I, I think his lack of leadership in certain areas has been, uh, especially in recent years, has been uh, um, embarrassing to me. That's just my two cents. And uh, it's a lot of different things, not just football related. So I, and I had a conversation with a friend the other day about some of the candidates and from what I hear, it's going to be good replacements, uh, and it'll be good for Notre Dame to have him not there. I just, I just, uh, I think it's going to be good for Notre Dame if they make the right hire when Father Jenkins is gone. I'm more concerned about what happens with Jack Swarbrick when he's gone. That, that's going to be a, that's going to be some big shoes to fill for somebody. Jack says, "Hey guys, my wife thinks the offensive holding penalty is dumb because isn't that what an offensive lineman is supposed to do?" I try to explain it, but can you guys do better? Why is holding bad? So holding is bad is because it gives the offensive player an unfair advantage relative to the, the talent level of the two players. So when you talk about, you know, who's going to win a battle in football, it's a one-on-one -on -one type of thing. You know, it's me and my athleticism and my technique compared to you and your athleticism and your technique. A defensive player doesn't benefit in the line from holding the way that an offensive player does. And so if I use, if I'm faster than you or bigger than you or quicker than you, or my technique is better than you, and I beat you, you need to take the L, right? Or try to recover. But holding is an unfair advantage that negates my ability to beat you. It's the same thing on, on, the, on the opposite side when you're talking on outside. So like a receiver versus a DB. Now the DB is the one that gets the unfair advantage. So if I beat you and I'm about to go by you and you grab and hold me, you're now having an unfair advantage that I can't really counter. And I don't have a, 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 a similar thing in my repertoire to go to, to beat you. And so it's really about, it's outside the framework of the way the game is supposed to be played. And it gives one side an unfair advantage on a particular play. So you can get beat and recover and it's not recovering with good technique or talent. You're recovering by cheating. That's the best thing that I can come up with. Rob Osgood said, hey, guys, question for the defense. What offensive line will be the toughest Notre Dame will face this year? And for offense, what will be the toughest D-line Notre Dame will face? Defensive line is easy. We've talked about this one before. It's Clemson. I mean, Clemson, to me, is the best defensive line Notre Dame is going to face all, all year this year. I, I think no, Clemson will have the best – Clemson has a, a – a, a, Clemson has a chance to have the best defensive line in college football, period. 
and not just Notre Dame's schedule. Offensive line is a little bit of a, a better question. I'd have to do a little more thinking about that one and, and really look at who comes back or not. Like I thought the kid from Marshall was coming back. I didn't even realize he transferred from Virginia Tech till Brian told me or Ryan told me. So I'm have to look at that one. But the good thing is, Rob, that is definitely already on the summer schedule. We're going to go through every team and you know, best quarterbacks, best running backs, best lines, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to have a lot to talk about when we get to our opponents when we get into this, this season. So uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But the defensive line was easy. It's it's Clemson. I think Clemson might have the best defensive. I mean, we, everybody talks about Brian, Brian Breezy and Miles Murphy. I think Tyler Davis is a really good football player if he's healthy. He's back too. So that's another one. Rob Compton, how much do you think Buckner benefits from Brian Kelly leaving and Tommy Reese? Uh, let me see if I can find the second part of your question. Rob, it looks like there might have been more to it. Nope, did not add on to it. So, and Tommy being, I guess, the you know, the main guy kind of in charge for that one. So I think for me, it it comes down to I do think it's a benefit. I think that I think that number one, I'm a big believer that you need to have as few people in a quarterback's ear as possible, especially during a game. I, I want a quarterback talking to two people, the coordinator and the quarterback's coach. That is it. I don't want the head coach getting in his face, screaming at him every time he comes off the field. Because Malik Zaire's talked about this. Uh, I've talked to other players in the past. Like a quarterback would come off the field. Brian Kelly be in his ear telling him one thing. And this isn't practice and games. Then he'd go over to the assistant coach, the quarterback's coach, and he's telling him something different. And then the offensive coordinator tells him something different and you're getting like two to three different stories and that's terrible. And so I just, I think Brian Kelly became a negative influence on quarterbacks pretty soon into his Notre Dame career, especially once he gave up play calling. And so I just, I, I look at it and say, I think that's going to be a lo- look, there's going to be one person talking to you know, Brian Polian. There's going to be one person talking to Tyler Buckner and Drew Pine. And it's going to be Tommy Reese. That's it. Now, in regards to instruction, now the, you know it's like here's what you need to do. Now, if Tommy's up in the booth, which I think he will be, you're going to have you know either Chancey Stuckey or Dylan McCullough, who's ever's down the field, relaying plays or relaying instruction. You know, like during a timeout, and he may say, "Hey, you know, hey, do this," but he's telling him what Tommy Reese wants him to, to be told. You may have Marcus Freeman come off to him and say, "Hey, keep your head up, shake it off. Hey, I need you to do this. I need you to that." But it's not reading the defense. It's more of the head coach things you need him to do. Hey, you know, keep your head up. Don't worry about it. Need you to, you know, Hey, need you to protect the ball and then go hear from coach Reese on how that kind of thing, but it'll be more bigger picture stuff that all head coaches do. Not the head coach trying to tell them what to do or how to read it or what he should have saw when oftentimes it, it just wasn't, it wasn't what everybody else was saying. So that was uh that was my issue there. So I think in a lot of ways, that's going to be a benefit for Tyler Buckner. And it, and that's why I say, we're going to learn a lot about Tommy Reese this year. If Tyler Buckner does what I think he's going to do, his talent's part of it, but Tommy Reese developing him and and being that consistent voice is going to be a big part of that. I, I, there, there, there's no question about it. So Rob, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really important thing. I'm going to, we're going to end this. We have one more question. This is a good one. Just popped in. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame wins a playoff game or new year six bowl this year. If, and there's, there's not one thing. If what we just talked about with Tyler Buckner is legit, Tommy Reese has got him playing at a high level. Harry Heastand is who we think he is. At least one receiver steps up opposite Lorenzo Styles to be a good player. And Al Golden keeps things rolling with the defense. If those things happen, I think Notre Dame has a shot to win a championship this year. And I don't think any of those things are way out of the question. I Look, I, I may be off here. I just I have I feel like the changes that were made, the talent Notre Dame has coming back, the playmaker they have at quarterback, if they can just somewhat stay healthy and the quarterback pans out, I feel like this team has a chance to do something special. And I, I think there's a lot of assumptions about well, they can't win this game or that game and and the stuff. And and I don't know if Notre Dame's gonna be better now that Brian Kelly's gone. I, I don't know, but I believe they will. And I'm gonna be proven right or wrong about Brian Kelly here in the next couple of years. We'll find out. But I really felt like he was holding the team back. And we'll find out if Marcus Freeman is a guy to take him forward. We don't know the answer to that, but I, I believe that he will be. And I believe the talent is there to be it. So come on, everyone. 
like make as AK says, join the message board, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to our message board as well. Hit that notification bell, share the podcast, leave a five-star review. And as always, in the words of Mace AK, go Irish. Thank you all so much. I enjoyed the show. We'll be back tomorrow at four o'clock. We are going to talk about the upcoming decision by Devin Houston, the 2023 defensive lineman from Maryland, who will be making his decision between Notre Dame, Michigan, and several other schools tomorrow. You're definitely going to want to tune in tomorrow at four o'clock. So make sure you're there with us for that. We'll break it down. And then afterwards, we will have a Q&A tomorrow more. So if you had a question that I didn't get to today, save it, bring it back with you tomorrow. We'll have a lot more going tomorrow. So everybody, have a great, awesome rest of your day. Thank you all so much. We will talk to you soon. Appreciate you all being a part of the Irish Breakdown Podcast.